Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Bismillah. Alhamdulillah. It's very nice to be here with you all. And inshallah ta'ala, uh, this is a presentation that we've been going through where we put a few slides together over our retreat from the past year. And this is a topic that I believe to be of the highest importance because it relates to our connection to the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And ultimately, once we understand the importance of having a relationship with Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, we will then come to understand the importance of that what it is that we need to do in relation to the teachings that we receive from him. And there was a course synopsis that we developed for this, so I'm just going to read this and then make a few comments before we continue, inshallah ta'ala. So it says, there is no better way to learn about the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam than to study what the Lord of the heavens and earth has mentioned about him in his book. These sessions will explore the topic of the Qur'an and the Prophet, highlighting the centrality of connecting to him sallam. It is commonly said that the name of the Prophet Musa, Moses salam, is mentioned more than the name of the Prophet Muhammad, which is true. But what is often overlooked is that Allah speaks directly to the Prophet sallam, in the second person throughout the Qur'an. We will explore some of these verses as well as those that indicate the great stature and, uh, and special characteristics given to our Prophet by Allah Ta'ala. And so, we st the starting point really is, is that when we talk about the Shahada, which is how someone enters into Islam, were someone to say from now until Yawm Al-Qiyamah, La ilaha illallah only, there is no God but Allah, affirming divine unity, belief in one God. Were they to repeat that from now until Yawm Al-Qiyamah, but were they fail to add Muhammadan Rasulullah, they would not be Muslim. That's something simple in terms of understanding its meaning, but it's very profound. The Shahada is La ilaha illallah, Muhammadan Rasulullah. And just even that in and of itself, you could spend a session or two unpacking how deep the meanings of the Shahada La ilaha illallah Muhammad Rasulullah are. And that statement is a statement that is extremely pithy, i.e. packed with meaning. And so when we say La ilaha illallah Muhammad Rasulullah, in a more outward explanation of it, this is the phrase, this is the statement that summarizes the entire deen from beginning to end in all of its facets. Imanan, Islaman, and Ihsanan in relation to our faith, practice, and spirituality. This faith summarizes it. Everything that's in the religion, every individual teaching ultimately is under the rubric of La ilaha illallah Muhammad Rasulullah. And thus, that this is why Allah Ta'ala made this the way that someone enters into Islam. And so, all of the detailed teachings of belief, all of the detailed teachings of that fiqh where we get into legal rulings of the various acts of worship that we perform, that everything that we learn from our spiritual tradition, it's all in that. And then all of the other sciences that were developed to preserve the primary sources of the Qur'an, of the Hadith, and all of the instrumental sciences, all of this is included in the Shahada. And it also has the deepest esoteric that meaning as well in importance. And so that when you talk about people that have realized their faith, that see with the light of, of Allah, and this is possible because our Prophet told us that it is, the ittaqu firasat al-mu'min, fear the firasa, the inner sight of a believer, fa'innuhu yandhuru bi nurillah, he looks with the light of Allah. And someone who looks with the light of Allah is that type of person who Allah says, fabi yasma, through me he hears. That in through me he sees. Wabi yara. And in another narration, 
that this is a hadith Qudsi and one of the most important hadith Qudsi of all. In hadith Qudsi, I almost changed the topic last minute to uh, a presentation on divine injunctions, but Asibai prevented me. So we might have to dip into a little bit of the, the hadith Qudsi, because the hadith Qudsi are very special. And that in another one, فَإِذَا أَحْبَبْتُهُ When I come to love my servant, كُنْتُ سَمْعُ الَّذِي يَسْمَعُ بِهِ I become the ear through which he hears. وَبَصُرُ لِيُبْسِرُ بِهِ And the eyes through which he sees. Allahu Akbar. This is a human being who, that we don't worship human beings. Of course, that's a given. But look at the language. And I remember being in a gathering one time. Uh, we were, I was in uh, the Northern Virginia area. And we were waiting for Sheikh Abdul Hakim Murad to come. We were at Masjid in Mustafa, which is one of the special masajid there in the Northern Virginia area. And so that they just had the fakir say a few words as a filler to wait for the real speaker, Sheikh Abdul Hakim, who was coming. And so I, I ended up quoting this hadith. And there was a sister in the gathering who thought that the way that I translated it was shirk. Right? And she walked out of the masjid. And it's when you see this construct in Arabic, kuntu sam'u li yasma'u bih, how else are you going to translate this? Right? There's no other way to translate I will be the ear through which he hears and the eye through which he sees. Like, how is he going to translate that? Literally, it was a kuntu sam'ahu. You could get like a total little translation, but it doesn't make sense in English when you speak of it because kana is that a fi'l naqas. That's a, another story. But my point is, there's no other way to translate. That's what it means. And then obviously, you know that it doesn't have the anthropomorphic meaning. So then you have to understand what is really that being spoken about here. But then when Sheikh Abdul Hakim came, he didn't know what happened. And he reached a point in his talk where he was going to quote the same Hadith Qudsi. And then he said, and he paused and he said, Now, if there's any literalists here, then it's better that you stand up and leave the room, right? Which is literally what the sister did, right? Uh, before I translate this. And then he translated it almost the exact same way that I translated it. The point here being is that, look at the state of this individual. Now, what kind of individual is that? Where that Allah is the, that person is khalas. In a very different state, Allah has taken over that person's that, uh, the affairs and has guided them. And so when we say, La ilaha illa Muhammad Rasulullah, this is a profoundly deep spiritual meaning as well. And this is pointed to by the fact that it is written on the throne of God. What is the throne? In terms of magnitude, the throne is the greatest thing that Allah created in creation. Right? In terms of stature, it's the Prophet ﷺ. But in terms of magnitude and size, nothing is greater than the throne of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And this is why that for instance, in the Dua of Qarb that we say, La ilaha illallah al-Azim al-Haneem, La ilaha illallah Rabb al-Arsh al-Azim. It's one of those that we praise Allah. He is the Lord of the magnificent throne. He's the Lord of the great throne. And what is the throne? And that we know that in a hadith, is that the kursi, which is the footstool, and that all of the seven heavens, which exponentially get greater and greater, combined are like a ring thrown in a vast desert compared to the kursi. And then we know the wasiya kursiyu samawati wal ard, as Allah says in ayat kursi, is that His throne encompasses the heavens and the earth. And then that the kursi and everything that it contains is like a ring thrown in a vast desert compared to the throne of Allah wa ta'ala. And written on it is La ilaha illallah Muhammad Rasulullah. And we have narrations that indicate, one of them being in the collection of Imam al-Hakam in his Mustadrak, is that when Adam made his mistake, and he asked Allah Ta'ala to forgive him by the rank of the Prophet Muhammad wasallam, is that Allah then asked him how he knew about the Prophet Muhammad. And he said that I saw it written on the throne. La ilaha illallah Muhammad Rasulullah. And so, these are meanings that point to the reality of La ilaha illallah Rasulullah. But then you can start going even deeper and deeper and deeper. And truly understanding who our Prophet is, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And that the scholars of the spiritual tradition say is that 
Muhammad Rasulullah is the tarjama of La ilaha illallah. And that gets very deep and very difficult to understand. But this is what is referred to when you have the likes of Uwais al Qarni saying to the great companions, Sayyidina Umar and Sayyidina Ali, you've only known the shadow of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And what they're indicating there is that there's a reality of the Muhammadan nature. And that among the verses that point to that, and we're going to come back to this verse when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Wasbur li hukmi rabbika. Be patient with the hukm of your Lord. And that can be translated as judge as decree or judgment. Be patient with the decree of your Lord. Fa innaka bi'ayunina. Indeed, you are under our watchful eyes in no anthropomorphic way. They say this is one of the verses that points to the true nature of Rasulullah And why is this so important? This is so important because those who came before us throughout the centuries until this day and age, but especially the epitome of this was embodied in that great generation of companions who took directly from the Prophet ﷺ. They understood who Rasulullah ﷺ was and is. And this is a travesty, is that you can find videos online of people taking their shahada where they say, La ilaha illa Muhammad Rasulullah, there is no God but Allah, Muhammad was the Messenger of Allah. As opposed to is, this is a travesty, is that was would be translated kana Muhammadun Rasulullah. Is that la ilaha illa Muhammadun Rasulullah is a nominal sentence that is outside of time. There is a reality to the Nabuwa and the Prophet of our Prophet Muhammad that's come in authentic hadith from the time that Adam was yet to be fashioned and it was described as being between clay and water. And that all of a sudden, just because he's no longer here, there's not a reality to his nubuwa, to his prophethood, sallallahu alayhi wa is that there's not a reality to his risada. He conveyed that message, but the meanings of prophethood and messengership remain. And they will continue to be there all throughout the world in the barzakh and then until Yom Qiyamah and then eternally forever and ever. And so this is essential because... There is arguably nothing more dangerous than try to separate our connection to the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Everything else is built upon that. This is the secret of the companions, is that they understood who the Prophet was. And lest we forget, everything in our religion we learn through the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Everything. The most important thing that we learn is what? Tawheed. Belief in the divine unity. And how do we learn that? We learn that through the Prophet ﷺ. And this is clearly stated towards the end of Surah Al-Kahf, where our, our Allah Tabarakwata says, Qul, say, O Prophet, إِنَّمَا أَنَا بَشَرٌ مِثْلُكُمْ I am a bashar, I am a human being like you. The Prophet ﷺ was a human being. He was like us so that he could be our exemplar and so that we could follow him. However, he was not like other human beings. What does Allah Ta'ala then say? Yuha ilay. That I receive revelation. Revelation comes to me. And then what is mentioned right after that? Annama ilahukum ilahun wahid. That indeed that your Lord is one Lord. Your, your, the Lord that you worship is one. In other words, Tawheed. What is greater for us to learn than the meanings of Tawheed, belief in divine unity? And as Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that says, وَعَلَّمَكَ مَا لَمْ تُكُنْ تَعْلَمْ وَكَانَ فَضْلُ اللَّهِ عَلَيْكَ عَظِيمًا Is that He taught you that which you used to not know. And the bounty of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala upon you was great. And then, فَذْكُرُونِي أَذْكُرْكُمْ لَا إِلَهَ إِلَّا Is it which one of us knows that if we remember Allah, Allah remembers us. 
Which one of us would have known that without Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala teaching that to the Prophet وسلم, and then conveying that reality to us. Rem no, remember me and I will remember you. And this verse has multiple, multiple meanings. Remember me with repentance and I will remember you with forgiveness. Remember me in times of hardship and I will remember you in times of ease. I will remember you in times of hardship. And this meaning is a very important meaning for us. These gatherings that we're now in, this is tazawud. This is a practical manifestation of seeking provision for what we need to experience the vicissitudes of life. Everybody here will experience difficulties. But if we invest time in building our spiritual immune system, we invest time in strengthening our iman, learning what it is that we need to learn and to striving to put it into practice, we will then have provision when we're tested. And all of us will be tested. And this is stated in the hadith, Come to know Allah in times of ease. And Allah will know you in times of difficulty. And this is how we need to be as believers. We need to know, have Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's assistance in times of difficulty. Because it is that divine assistance that turns the most difficult possible tribulation imaginable into something that's very easy for the human being to experience. And don't think that situations that we see as completely mind-blowingly horrific, that there's not divine gentleness in them. Is that we see the outward of things. We don't know really what's transpiring. In places like Gaza right now as we speak and in the West Bank and other places is that there is that divine gentleness taking place even though the surface level of it is the most horrific thing that you can possibly imagine and some of these stories slip sneak out here and there about these amazing moments where Allah Ta'ala descends because Sakina comes from above Allah sends down Sakina and if Allah grants someone tranquility and calmness and rest at the level of the heart is that no matter what it is that they're going through for the companions is that they would be in battle and they would doze off. This is mentioned in the Quran. The Sakina was so great for them. It's in the Quran. They would doze off in battle. Who in their right mind could ever possibly doze off when you're staring death right in the eye in a real battle not behind a sniper rifle with a telescope with swords and you have to slice someone's head off and you see blood and killing and body parts all around you and you can doze off that's the way that the companions were is that they were people and this was the description of the great Ansar, but the companions were like this. There were people is that, and the tama, when it related to requiring acquiring worldly things, none of them were ever to be seen. But and the faza, when there were times of difficulty, that's where you would find them. This is how they were. When it came to times of distributing war booty and that that giving things of this world, as you wouldn't find the true companions of the close companions of the Prophet system. They didn't care about that thing. People of dunya, yes, that you would find them in those times. But people of akhirah, khalas, is that you find them where times where they're really in need, where there really was a need, where times where that uh, many people were that scared to be certain places, but they had the courage to be there. This is where you'd find the great companions of the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alaihi wasallam, and that's how you and I need to be. Look at the last verses. Uh, Surah Al Juma, where Allah Ta'ala teaches us a lesson about abandoning the Prophet. There was a time where the prayer was actually first and the sermon came after. And after this verse was revealed, it was reversed, where the sermon went first and then the prayer was after. And so Allah Ta'ala teaches us, Ya Yulil Amanu, Ida Nudia Lis Salati min Yomun Jumati. Oh, you who believe, is that. When the Adhan is called on the day of Juma, the call to prayer is called on the day of Juma. Fas'aw ila dhikrillah. 
hasten to the remembrance of Allah. And so we know that the Salat al two rakaz is that of it is in place of the Luhar prayer is that Allah has placed a sermon. So Allah has called that sermon that goes along with those abridged two rakaz dhikr of Allah. Because we know the meaning of dhikr Allah, remembrance of Allah, has simultaneous the meaning of remembrance, i.e. invocation, calling upon God's name, but it also has the meaning of learning knowledge, of listening to an admonition that prepares the heart to know Allah. فَاسْأَوْ إِلَى ذِكْرِ اللَّهِ الْبَيْعِ Leave all transactions, any financial transactions, any buying and selling, and then the later fuqaha, once during the time of Sayyidina Uthman bin Affan, that there was two adhans, one to indicate the entrance of the prayer time, the second meaning that the khutbah was just about to start. The ulama then said, is that to transact after the first adhan is mukru, is disliked. To transact after the second adhan is haram. For those that it is wajib, it is an obligation upon them to pray Salat al-Jumma. And then Allah Ta'ala goes on to say, Once that you have performed the prayer, فَانْتَشِرُوا فِي الْأَرْضِ That go about in the earth, scatter about in the earth. وَبْتُهُ مِنْ فَضْلِ Seek from the bounty of Allah. And it is for this reason that some used to like to that purchase something after Salat al-Jumma to fulfill this commandment which is a commandment for ibaha to make something permissible, but they would like to buy something, even though it's in the form of a can, that seek from the bounty of Allah. So they would buy fruit or a small little item or something to drink or something like this to put this command into practice. Remember Allah often in hopes that you are successful. And then Allah Ta'ala says that what's called la alakum nufilhun wa ida ra'u tijaratan aw lahwan faddu ilayha wa tarakuka qa'ima so that they see some form of commerce what happened was there was a caravan that came aw lahu lahu is a type of that idle play that you're doing something that is essentially meaningless that you're just playing around that they leave you standing so you were standing delivering the sermon and that caravan came, this is a time where there was straight circumstance, they thought in it was provision, they left the Prophet and that went to the caravan. And unfortunately this is what many of us have done during our time, is that we metaphorically have left the Prophet We've left his teachings. But when we read these verses, is that the practical meaning for you and I, because we were not there in that time, is that we should say in our hearts, I'm never going to leave the Prophet I'm never going to leave his teachings. No matter what is presented before me, no matter what opportunity that I have, no matter what worldly thing that I have an opportunity to that derive pleasure from, is that we're never leaving the Messenger of Allah is that we want to be people who stand by the Prophet's side for us, metaphorically speaking, by putting his teachings into practice until the day that we meet our Lord. And what does Allah then say? تَرَكُوكَ قَائِمًا قُلْ مَا عِنْدَ اللَّهِ خَيْرٌ مِنَ اللَّهُ وَمِنَ التِّجَارَةِ So this is getting into this topic of the Quran and the Prophet So the verses before are speaking about what? The companions leaving the Messenger of Allah outwardly, but look at the next verse. This is why the Quran requires tadabbur, that we reflect upon it. Look at the station of Rasulullah. Allah then says that, say, O Prophet, what is with Allah? Ma'inda khayrun is that what with is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is better from lahwa, from this play and commerce. Wallahu khayr raziqeen Allah is the best of all providers. Meaning, outwardly, when they're there in front of the Rasul, Allah says, is that the good that comes to them is directly from Him. Allah could have said, is that, Qul, that ma'anda Rasul, the khair that you get from being in the presence of the Messenger, is better than lahwi wa tijar. But Allah says, Qul ma'anda Allah. In other words, that those realities that when you're before the Messenger of Allah, 
is that you are receiving khair directly from Allah. So who then is our Prophet And again, we should state from the outset is that nobody worships the Prophet This was not something that we ever had a problem with. This is not, no one in the history of the Ummah has committed shirk in relation to the Prophet Every Muslim knows that only Allah is a nafa and a da, the one who truly benefits and harms. Every Muslim knows that. No one has ever worshipped the Prophet ﷺ throughout the centuries. This simply just didn't happen. This was not the worry of our Prophet ﷺ. And it's just interesting that those that actually became fanatical about anyone, it was more with some that of certain sects that in relation to Sayyidina Ali, not in relation to the Prophet ﷺ. So this has never been a problem, but it's essential that you and I, for us to have a sound approach to our religion, to understand our relationship to Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And unfortunately, many of the uh, various ways of teaching out there to various degrees are either on the point of inkar, where they are putting into question what are actually standard ways of understanding our connection, or that, and that's at worst, or at best, oftentimes we find people limit it as if it's something that's not important. And people have that perspective of, is that, Kana Muhammadun Rasulullah. The Prophet was the Messenger of Allah. Almost in the sense is that the Prophet came, he conveyed the message, and that's it. And that's dangerous. That will prevent us from understanding that realities of this deen that you and I must know to be able to have sound religious practice. So this is really the backdrop to this presentation. And this is what we really hope to get out of it, is that to understand the centrality in our religion of connecting to the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, of understanding who he is. And if you're going to use the word was, it would be who he was, who he is, and who he will be. Because it doesn't just stop with this world. Is that people who truly know Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, and just look at, there's multiple narrations about the questions that were asked in the grave, but one of them is that the angels will ask us, ماذا تقول في هذا الرجل? What do you say about this man? Hada is an ism ishara. What do you say about this man? There's different understandings that the scholars have here. But those who know the Prophet ﷺ and truly know him, and the more they know about him and his exalted stature with Allah, the more ability they all will have to answer that question in the way that is most pleasing to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, because there's degrees to how people answer that question. And the more that we know him, if it wasn't important, why would we be asked that? If it was just about us and Allah, then why would the only question be, why wouldn't the only question be in the grave is, Man Rabbuk. The Prophet came to teach us Tawheed, khalas, that's it. That's all we need to know. So the only question we're going to be asked in this grave is, that who is your Lord? That's not the only question. We will also be asked about the Prophet is that what we believe about him. We will also be asked about that, that our religion. Our deen. And so what do we say? We won't, wouldn't know anything about our religion. Beginning with the most important aspect of that, which is Tawheed. And moving to all of the details that come. When we have this three-dimensional practice from this perfect balance between Iman, Islam, and Ihsan. All of these different dimensions. All of them in their entirety are based upon submission. And it just so happens because Nurun ala Nur is the light of revelation upon the light of the intellect. Is that our religion is coherent. It makes sense. It makes sense. Is that it's rooted in knowledge. And so the fact that you have scholars of Aqidah, you could translate it simply as creed or when it gets that into its more sophisticated form, ilm al-kalam, however you choose to translate that, that speculative or dialectical theology, however you choose to translate that, is that they developed a platform whereby which our beliefs could be articulated to people that don't see eye to eye to us in how we interpret scripture, or even those who don't believe in the same scripture that we believe in. 
This is amazing that the scholars have done this. And the fact that you could that talk about an ethical theory on how it is that we approach acquiring that character traits and ridding ourselves of that vices and adorning our heart with virtues, this is from the beauty of Islam and the very unique discipline of Islamic legal theory on how we extract that, uh, that uh, individual rulings from the Qur'an and the Sunnah. That this is amazing and how coherent and logical and how it makes sense. This is a great blessing from Allah Ta'ala. But, is that the intellect there use, is used to understand. The fact that it's coherent is because it's true. Allah made it that way. And that when the two come together, this is really what we want. But we can never forget that even when we're using our intellect, is that that really is in second place. It's rooted ultimately in revelation. And this is something that people in our time have a difficulty understanding. And that starts with that many people around us that are from various denominations of Christianity. And you can ask Dr. Ali al why that's the case and he can give you a very sophisticated and detailed breakdown of why. But that extends to that people of other faiths as well, including Jews and including that many people of different religions and then just people that are products of the modern world. And that how dumbed down people have become and just are just in a state that they've inherited as a result of growing up in the zeitgeist of our particular time. And this is a concept that most people don't fully understand. And this is one of the things that I've always loved so much about Islam. When we have these very clear definitions of what's a Nabi, what's a Prophet, what's a Rasul, what's a Messenger. What are the four necessary, i.e., that when we speak about that buttressing our faith with logic and with the intellect, what are the four qualities that we assign to the messengers? This is amazing. This is, this is the way that we preserve the way that human beings are supposed to view prophets. Anyone that's had exposure to a skewed view of that and things that are said about prophets in uh, previously revealed scriptures, or at least that the distorted versions that are before us, is that it's repulsive. And you realize, like, how could you say that? How could you say that about a prophet of God that makes no sense? And then you have to follow them? How could you follow someone that could potentially sin? How could you follow someone that would commit such an abomination according to what you're saying? That doesn't make any sense. Whereas Isma, and the scholars took this very seriously, and they uh, developed a whole interpretive methodology of how to understand the mistakes of the prophets who came before us. Right? Like that of Adam والسلام, as well as the other prophets and messengers. And that's a very, very important topic where there still is a lot of confusion in our community. And I would actually recommend that MCC does a seminar with Dr. Ali on that, on Isma. Like, this is essential. What does it mean that to understand the infallibility of the prophets? And why is this so important? That this is a very, very that key topic to get right, because so much is built upon that after that. So this is all why that we're doing this. And... There are multiple ways that we can ultimately come to learn about our Prophet Sallallahu But one of the things that becomes clear for someone who looks very carefully in the Book of Allah and to see how often Allah addresses the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi or speaks about the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi or the context of the verse is directly and related to something that happened to the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi is that you start to realize, hmm, this is ajeeb. And there's a beautiful dua by Habib Ali ibn Humayn Habshi where he talks about the Qur'an and he talks about ta'lif وَأَلِّفْ بَيْنِي وَبَيْنَ كُلَّ عَرْفًا وَآيَةً وَصُورَةً اِتِلَافًا لَا يُفَرُّكُنَا تَرْفَةَ عَيْنِ And so ilfa or ulfa is familiarity. And you could generally translate this as connection. And essentially the dua of this great imam is, Oh Allah, bless me to have a connection to 
every ayah, uh, every harf, every letter of the Qur'an, every kalima, every word of the Qur'an, every ayah, every verse in the Qur'an, and every chapter in the Qur'an, every surah. Ittilafan, a connection that never leaves us for even the blink of an eye. So look at that amazing dua that we learned on this great wadith, this great inheritor of the Prophet And there are inheritors that have reached a maqam with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala where that their portion of irth, of inheritance of the Rasul is so great that Allah has actualized that in them. And if that is someone who comes after the time of the Prophet i.e., is that they are putting every verse of the Qur'an into practice to, with relative degrees of perfection. Absolute perfection is for Allah. But then we talk about relative degrees of perfection. So relative degrees of perfection is like if someone, to use a basketball metaphor, is that if someone is 10 for 10 from the line, they were 100%, right? That was per that's perfect. But if someone's 20 for 20, that's even more perfect. Why? Because it's harder to hit 20 free throws in a row and not just 10. But if someone was 100 for 100, wow, that's a pretty good free throw shooter. Yani, that's a much higher degree of perfection than just 10 for 10. There's a lot of people who can hit 10 straight free throws. But there's very few people who can hit 20 straight. There's very few people ever that could ever, maybe it might not have ever been done, hit 100 straight. But it might have if someone hit 1,000 free throws straight. That's more perfect than 10 for 10. And 10 for 10 is more perfect than 3 for 3, and so forth. So there's degrees of perfection. But there are great imams of this religion who have been blessed to put the entire Qur'an into practice. And this is why they are devoted to it so much. Read what Imam Anawi says about the connection that we should have to the Book of Allah. He says, the most is that has reached us, and this is going to blow your mind, is that he knew people, and there's narrations of people, doing eight khatams of the Qur'an every single day. Now that seems impossible. Right, the way we think about time, okay, okay, a fast reciter can recite in 15 minutes. Like a super fast reciter can do a juzit in 15 minutes. And so that, that means it's four juzit per hour. And then that seven times four is 28. So basically about eight hours roughly is the quickest that you can possibly that do a khatam of the Qur'an. And if you times that by two, such so you're reciting Qur'an for 16 hours a day, and that you have to get a little bit of sleep and do a little bit of something else, is that you might be able to fit in like two and a half khatams a day if you write. That's a very outward measure of it. But the way that people experience time is not uniform. If Allah places barakah in your time, is that you quite, in a very real way, will be able to recite in ways that other people don't. But that's a whole other topic in of itself, Understa understanding how you and I cannot just have but experience barakah in our time. It's still possible. But there are things that we have to do, and there are things that we have to resist. There's things that we have to resist. And many of these things that we have to resist are things that are ingrained into us, living in the world in which we live, that are actually very hard for us to overcome. And you usually only see these types of things in people that grow up in very different realities and grow up in societies where their conception of time is very different than our conception of time. Although, it is possible even here for people that if that door opens up for them too, that experience the blessing in someone's time. But this is primarily an affair of the heart and a matter of the ruh and of the spirit. And the essence of this matter relates to, to the extent that our ruh, our spirit, dominates that who we are, as opposed to our nafs, will be to the extent that you and I have barakah or blessing in our time will be to the extent that we experience it. Is that the more we do taghdiyya to ruh, is that we that give provision to the spirit 
and that we that have this ability to that tap into this incredible potential of the ruach. When you start talking about this, it starts sounding like pseudo spirituality and modern nonsense, uh, but it's very very true. Is that the more that we the ruh it's a secret from Allah Taala, and the ruh is what makes us truly human, and the alam and arwah is where we truly should be residing. And the only thing that is preventing us is is that being trapped in the realm of the sensory. So when you combine that to the society in which we live in the billions and billions and billions and billions of dollars that are spent to trap us in the realm of sensory, whether it's consciously or subconsciously, this is what's happening. As this is the realm of desire and this is the realm, uh, realm of greed and that living excessively and extravagance and opulence and what happens is that the power of the ruh, if you will, is covered by that what ensues in the heart when we have unmitigated that uh, access to this world and just think about that how in our time it's so much more difficult than in previous times so this is what we want to get back to and so this is inshallah what we're going to be speaking about uh, so we can move inshallah ta'ala to the first signs you can see that this was uh, part of the retreat that we did this past uh, year um, and the, the first session is really on connecting to the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam so we want to start right here at the basics and that we're not assuming any prior knowledge in a class like this some of you are, are very advanced and um, that already have a good understanding, but we need to start from the beginning for uh, those of us that are less advanced. And, um, and reminders are also always good. Um, actually, no, it just went back. So this is the first supplication of the Quran. Everybody knows Surah Al-Fatiha, of course. And again, this is actually, some of these things are very obvious, but some of the purposes, part of the purpose of this is to cause us to see what we get so used to seeing that we fail to actually see what's really there. So when Allah Ta'ala says, إِهْدِنَ الصِّرَاطِ الْمُسْتَقِينَ Which is the first supplication in the Qur'an. Okay? And this teaches us the etiquettes of supplication. How does the Qur'an begin? Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. And then, we praise Allah. Alhamdulillahi Rabbil Alameen. Ar-Rahman Ar-Rahim. Maliki Yawmiddin. Iyaka Na'budu. And so we praise Allah and then we declare, Iyaka na'budu, you alone do we worship. This is the sharia. Wa iyaka nasta'in, this is the haqiqah. And you alone do we seek help. Allah is teaching us right there in that verse, verse 5. What we constantly talk about is the two sides of the same coin. Iyaka na'budu is the sharia. Iyaka wa iyaka nasta'in is the haqiqah. That's the reality. Is that? We have to do our part. You alone do we worship. But we recognize is that we can't do it ourselves. We have to rely upon Allah. Everything that we see in this world, we have to see it from two sides of the same coin. This has to be pounded into our hearts over and over again. This is what's going to prevent us from despairing. And we mentioned yesterday in the khutbah, is that إِنَّهُ لَا يَيْأَسُ مَنْ رَوْحِ لَا إِلَّا الْقَوْمَ الْكَافِرُونَ It is only the disbelieving people that despair from the mercy of Allah. Is that believers do not, dis they do not despair from the mercy of Allah. لَا تَيْأَسُ مَنْ رَوْحِ لَا Do not despair from the mercy of Allah. It is not an option for us. No matter what is happening in Palestine or anywhere else in the Muslim world, it is not an option for us to despair from the mercy of Allah. That's from that one perspective. From the standpoint of reality, everything has to be seen as being from Allah. Nothing happens outside the power of Allah. Nothing. No atrocity, no oppression, no tyranny. Nothing happens outside the power of Allah. And at the same time, the Iyaka Na'buda part is, this relates to the Sharia is that if there's wrong, you have to recognize wrong as wrong. You always have to see wrong as wrong. And then simultaneously that you have to see that wrong as being from Allah. Both 
are how we have to be. And you will find in the Quran sometimes that we're pointed to thinking about things that in relation to that the standpoint of the means. That uh, so Allah says about our Prophet that indeed that you guide to the straight path. In one verse. Indeed that you guide to the straight path. And then another verse Allah says that indeed that that uh, that indeed you do not guide, Allah is the one who guides whom He wills. How do you put those, how do you reconcile those? From this side of the same coin, is that this is the outward dimension. Our Prophet, one of his names is Al-Hadi. He's a guide. He's a means for people's guidance. But the reality is, guidance only comes from Allah. This is perhaps one of the most important things of all that we need to understand when we are involved in current events. This is what keeps us sane. This is what keeps us sane. Because if you, and there's different types of the empathy, I remember being at a that psychology conference and there was a lady there who um, had done work um, uh, and had been exposed to that um, very horrific things that human beings have done in Rwanda. And she, she said that I realized that there's a difference between that... Um, emotional empathy and cognitive empathy and what she said about emotional empathy was is that she started replaying what she had been told about all the things that have happened murders and rapes and all of these horrible things in her mind and it was causing her severe dis imbalance as a result so she said that she had to shift to what's called what she called cognitive empathy where is that Cognitive empathy is where there's empathy and you are aware of people's suffering but you don't replay the events in your mind. And um, that ultimately empathy we have to have. That's part of being a believer. That's part of that being a member of the Ummah of our Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi uh, but there's a way that we have to understand that empathy, one, in a balanced way. And then there's a way that that empathy translates into action. And if we don't understand the balance between the outward and the inward, the sharia and the haqiqah, and seeing everything from two different, in two different ways that are two sides of the same coin, then we'll get it wrong. And that we'll, it will end up on one, in one way of one extreme or the other. And deep down inside that our, our teachers pound this into the heart. And when you speak about this, sometimes it sounds a little bit insensitive. It's not insensitive. This is the essence of how we're supposed to be as a believer. But this is the reality that everything that happens to any member or the Ummah collectively in any given time, here in this world, is ultimately a mercy. Even though outwardly, it looks to be unimaginable. This is haq. How else are we going to understand the 75 years of what's transpired in Palestine? How else are we going to understand everything that happened during the colonial period? Everything that's happened recently in wars. Is that for the believer, is that everything that happens, any that sickness, calamity, difficulty they experience in this world is an atonement so they return to Allah in a good state. And in reality, when people believe in the hereafter and were we to be able to see people that are martyred, are people that have gone through incredibly difficult things here in this world, what they receive in the hereafter, and were you to ask them in the hereafter, they would want to come back and actually suffer more. That's the reality. They would want to come back and suffer more after seeing what Allah has in store for them, and they would be willing to be patient with more suffering in this world so they could have more in the hereafter. That's haq. That's reality. Now that doesn't mean that, on the other hand, we want suffering. A'udhu billah. Do you see the balance? That's from the standpoint of reality. 
And then from the outward perspective is that we have to do everything we can possibly do to stand for justice, to live right, to call what is to what is good and to forbid what is evil, and to love what Allah loves and to detest what Allah Ta'ala detests. That's a part of it. That's how we balance these two realities. And that usually what happens is, is that we kind of move a little bit in this direction, but then we have to bring it back. And then we move a little bit in this direction, then we have to bring it back. And that ignorant people are people that, if I would say what I just said, there would be a lot of people that criticize what I'm saying. Because there is this, it's this type of understanding that says, and people have surely said this in relation to like events in Palestine, for instance, where can you, we don't want your prayers, we want action. And that's a very ignorant thing to say. We don't want your prayers, we want action. That's very ignorant to say that. Right, and that, that's actually a very dangerous thing to say. And that is indicative of a very skewed perspective where someone's completely imbalanced in this direction. And one, there's some false assumptions that underlie a statement like that. Is that, one, they don't understand the power of du'a and how real it is. Two, they don't understand the relationship between the outward and the inward. Our Prophet was promised victory on the day of Badr. And he said to the companions, it is as if I'm looking at the spots where the disbelievers are going to fall dead. He saw it before the battle. But the night before, he stayed up praying to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, calling upon his name, Ya Hayyu Ya Qayyum, the living and self subsistent, to the extent that Sayyidina Abu Bakr Siddiq said, Hasbuk Ya Rasul, enough Ya Allah, Right, He was so worried about him. But this points to the, so they don't understand that, which is number two, that's a false assumption. Three, is that it's assuming that people are actually making dua. Which one of us is really making dua? Like in the past week, when have we ever made a true dua? Have we cried in the past week? Have we cried in the past month? Have we cried in the past year? Have we ever shed a tear for the ummah in our entire life. You'd be surprised how many Muslims that are not weeping, rarely ever weep. And that we should have been weeping for the Ummah before October 7th. That after, and we should be weeping for them until the day that we die. Is that I have teachers that I know that sometimes they are weeping so heavily for the Ummah of the Prophet and where their child comes in and sees them and thinks that they're having like a seizure or something. Because it's what's called the talahab, a lahab bil buka, where it's like their body is like convulsing as a result of how they're turning to Allah. That's dua. That's the sunnah. Like making dua every single night in the wee hours at the night and throughout the day with a heart that is present and being emotionally involved in it, where you're shedding tears. And in a very real way, you're feeling the pain of the Ummah while you're supplicating with what is called hurqa. And one of the greatest things we can bring to our heart for the sake of Allah is what is called hurqa. And hurqa is literally where is that your heart is burning. And we do it out of our ubudiyah, out of our servitude to Allah because that's how He wants us to be. When we're bringing to heart, it's hurqa. That our heart, and I remember someone uh, speaking of one of the those who was in service of the Ummah of our Prophet Sallallahu and they likened him to a reed flute. A reed flute is burned on the inside. And that precisely because it's burned on the inside, then when you blow into it, it produces a beautiful sound. And that people who have harka, where their insides are burning for the sake of the Ummah, of our Prophet ﷺ. These are people that do beautiful things outwardly for people. And again, this is the outward and the inward dimension. This is how we are. This relates to being like monks at night, being like knights or lions during the day. The passive active relationship, the inward and outward, the sharia and the haqiqah, 
اهدنا الصراط المستقيم and that إياك نعبد وإياك نستعين this relates to this reality and then look at the beauty of the Quran it's only after that we then have this state we've praised Allah and we've said that Ya Rabb is that we're devoting ourselves entirely to you and realize there's nothing we can do without you. We're completely placing our trust in you. Recognize that you are the Rabb, you are the Lord of history. And we know that Aqibah is the Muttaqeen in this world before even the hereafter. We know that history is in good hands. We need this dual perspective, otherwise we will make for anywhere from minor to major mistakes. And then we ask the first dua after all of that. The Quran is profound. We ask Allah to guide us to the straight path. We ask Him for Hidayah. And we're asking Him that to guide us to the straight path. But then, what does Allah Ta'ala say immediately? Allah could have just said, guide us to the straight path. Why does He mention examples? <laughs> of people in general right after this. This is setting up our relationship to the exemplars, the inheritors, the prophets themselves. This is right here in the Fatiha indicating to us the importance of connecting. For us, it's connecting to the awliya, it's connecting to the ulama, it's connecting to the waratha, the scholars, the pious, the inheritors of the Prophet and for those that live during times of prophets, connecting directly to the prophets. This is right there in the Fatiha, but it's overlooked. The centrality, what is more central than the Fatiha? That all of the meanings of the Qur'an are in the Fatiha, all the meanings of the Fatiha are in Bismillah ar rahim all the meanings of the Bismillah are in the first nukta til ba, the first direct, when you first start to write the ba. This is profound. This is indicating to us how our deen is. And unfortunately, where you still talk about these meanings, people say, just worship Allah, brother. Don't commit shirk. Don't overly praise people. Don't, you know, there's no need to focus on that. The book of Allah is telling us differently. Allah could have simply said, guide us to the straight path. And said that this is the straight path. But right after that, he says, the path of those, and this is why you see it in bold on the slide before you, the path of those you have blessed. And then, the two archetypes of those that we don't want to follow. So there's clarity right from the very beginning. The maghdubi alayhim, not those you are displeased with. And generally speaking, we could think about them as people who know, but fail to put their knowledge into practice for one reason or another. Usually relating to the overcoming of the ego. And then the waladhalin, those who are astray, are those who go astray without knowledge. These are the two great archetypes of how people go astray. Either someone doesn't have knowledge or they have knowledge and fail to put it into practice. And then we can understand the context of the, this verse where Allah Ta'ala says, He speaks about ma'iyya, witness. And the very first job of the Mufassar, the one who is commenting on the Qur'an, is to look at what other verses clarify or comment on the verse that you're trying to understand. So this verse directly clarifies those whom Allah has bestowed His favor upon. So in the verse before, it's left in general. Those that you have, blessed. Here, that we learn who are the four great categories of those who Allah has blessed. So again, look very carefully at this. So this is imprinted on your heart and it never leaves. And it becomes the way that you practice your deen until you die. This is haq. This is truth. وَمَنْ يُتِعِ اللَّهَ وَرَسُولُ Whoever obeys Allah and the Messenger. So again, we're going to get more into this as we go further. But notice Allah says, Allah wa Rasul. How many times does He do this in the Quran? Obedience of Allah is through obeying the Messenger. Obeying the Messenger is obeying Allah. 
And there's other verses that are explicit about this. فَأُولَٰئِكَ Those people that obey Allah and His Messenger مَعَ Allah Allah Is that when we read that مَعَ We don't want to just pass over this and act like it's not important. Allah is teaching us to desire and long for this withness, this togetherness, this ma'iyah. Why else is it there? Everything in the Quran is perfectly placed. Allah is teaching us to desire this. We want to be with these people. And if it wasn't important, if it was only about our relationship with Allah, why is Allah saying that we're going to be with them if it's not important? It makes no sense. That perspective makes no sense. It's there because Allah wants us to be with them eternally. And because by being with them eternally, is that then we're opening up the door for us to receive the divine favor and bounty. And the scholars who truly understand these meanings say, to the degree that we are close to the Prophet ﷺ in paradise, will be the degree which that we receive the bliss of paradise, including the gaze upon the noble countenance of Allah Jalla Jalla. This is how you understand this. But this is why we need to rewire the way we see things. And when you start talking about it, it seems so obvious, but why do people fail to see it in this way? This is why we're doing this. So look at these meanings, they're very profound. Whoever obeys Allah and His Messenger, those people will be that ma'a with alladheena an'am Allahu alayhim, as it's translated here, in the company of those blessed by Allah. Who are they? Men and Nabiyeen. They are the prophets, was Siddiqeen, and they are the people of truth, the highest saints. They are the shuhada. The martyrs and the salihin, the righteous. And when was Allah Ta'ala then to emphasize this, wa hasuna ula'ika rafiqa. What honorable company. Rafiq, to be in their presence, to be a companion of them, to be with them. What is it going to be like? This should move us. One of the greatest intentions that we can make is that, Ya Allah, we want to live in a way where these people, the Nabiyyin, the Siddiqeen, and the Shuhada and the Salihin, all love us and approve of us and are waiting for us in the hereafter. There will be people that come now, 1400 plus years later, after the Prophet Muhammad who live in the end of time, in the most difficult time to possibly live in that all of the prophets forewarned their people about and told them about the time of the Antichrist and the Dajjal and the end of time scenarios and Allah only knows best when it's going to be but they achieve the highest degrees of closeness to Allah and imagine what the state is of an individual who returns to Allah and these people love him and you get these snippets from the dream world about what happens in the Barzakh, which is the intermediary realm. And one is a story of the great Imam Sayyidina Fuqiyya Muqaddim, Muhammad bin Ali bin Alawi. Is that there was a very important event in his life where there was a lot of political strife and they used to study with swords on their laps because there was a imminent threat at all times of conflict and civil strife. And Sayyidina Fagim Muqaddam is famously known for breaking the sword and indicating that we are taking a path of knowledge and dissemination of that knowledge and we're not going to get involved in political strife at all. And this was the way of his forefathers and this was in particular the way of Sayyidina Ali Zayn Abidin. This is why in the scholars that we study from, when they talk about their ancestors, is that even though it's obviously rooted in Ahl al kisa the blessed family of the Prophet ﷺ, but both Sayyidina Hassan and Sayyidina Ali took their positions that they had to take for valid reasons, and both of them were right and validated by Allah and His Messenger. But if you look at Sayyidina Ali Zayn Abidin, the sole surviving son of Imam Hussein, is that he took a very different trajectory. 
that he abandoned politics and anything that related to that the ruling state of believers and he took a path of in and ibadah and that with Allah of knowledge worship helping people and helping people and this is the tradition that's been inherited generation after generation generation after generation generation after generation and you find multiple manifestations of even those who don't have their asanid and they're changed directly through them all throughout the Muslim world here to this day and age these are the traditions that the likes of people here and many other people that you're learning from and you're privileged to learn from the barrier have taken from this is their way is that a way of self-refinement understanding is that the single most important thing of all is that every single individual tries to rectify their own soul this is the timeless job of the prophets and those of their inheritors that come after them is to help people refine their soul to come to know Allah and prepare for in the hereafter and to live right and to have wisdom and to put everything in its proper place and this can't be done if someone cannot curb their ego the greatest thing you can do for the world is to overcome your own ego so that you can spare the world from the potential havoc that your ego could would wreak your ego would wreak havoc on the world if you do not restrain it this is the single most important thing even if you it's unpopular to say that and people want action and they don't want prayer or they don't want these types of things that's this is haq this is the way of all of the true scholars and people uh, that have that receive these meanings by way of transmission back to the Prophet ﷺ. And that doesn't mean that you don't do other things. But it means is that that's your number one goal in life is to come to know Allah and to prepare for the hereafter. And the bulk of what it is that you do is in that. And living a life like that will help you when certain things happen that you can take certain stances. Because you're trained to do so in a way that is detached from the ego. And you can assess them correctly because you have a light that gives you a criterion to understand truth from falsehood. And speak in a balanced way that's not impassionated by the ego. The ego skews everything. And then sometimes you want to join a just cause, but you make things worse because you cannot control your ego and you have a skewed perspective. And so, when you put everything together then it all starts to make sense. This is what you're rooted in. And then you start adding to these other dimensions. And then there's times that our Prophet spoke about there were times that lacked clarity. And we can get into more of this before the day's over, because I, I do think it's important to hit head on, is that in a situation like the one we're in now, what are things we can all do? So if you please remind me, we'll come back to this and pick up exactly where I left off. But... Getting back to this ayah, and then we'll close here and take a 15-minute break. We're taught in the first verse, the first chapter of the Quran, and then the verse in Surah Tanisa that clarifies us, clarifies it. The importance of witness in Maya, the importance of connecting to these people, and that just to hammer that last point home. And I forgot to mention, Sayyidina Fakim Muqaddam, so I got distracted. So when he took this path, his teacher was not happy with him because his teacher wanted something specific from him in relation to outward knowledge but when he took the path of Tasawwuf is that he had a slightly different trajectory and his teacher forsook him until the day that he died and when he passed away Sayyidina Fugi was outside of the blessed city of Tarim now this is one of the Karamat uh, and these types of things are, are can happen and the famous story has it is that Sayyidina Fugi when he came back his teacher his name was Ba Marwan is that he swore an oath is that he wanted he still wanted his teacher to be pleased with him this is the way that people are they're people of adab even if they know they have to take a slightly different position from what the, what their teachers their who taught them might be is that they always have adab with their teachers and they always remain loyal to them and he said that he was going to remain in the minaret in the jamit mosque in Tirim until that he met with his teacher his teacher went to the barzakh and then the Mu'adhan, one day, comes in in the morning to call the Adhan. And he overhears a conversation between this great Imam and between his teacher. 
His teacher came to visit him from the buzzer, which is popular, is possible. This is possible. To prove this is possible, how did our Prophet him see the Prophet Moses on the night of Isra and Mi'raj, alive in his grave praying? This is possible. Allah brought all of the spirits of the Prophets to pray behind Rasulullah in Jerusalem. So these things are possible, and there's other examples of this. You know, that Jafar al-Tayyar, who was given wings to fly, to send salams to the Prophet said, These things are possible, and there's story after story to confirm this. So anyhow, what is possible in the time of the Prophets and their companions is also possible after them. So, he says to him, his teacher, Ba Marwan, he says, Ya Fuki, that when I went to the Barzakh, he said, I found the people of the Barzakh waiting for you, longing for you, the way that the people in Hadramaut wait for the date harvest. So in Hadramaut traditionally had very simple food. And it was usually something like just bread and dates. And maybe a few other things here and there from time to time. Some meats and some other occasional uh, that dishes that they might have. But the staple food was essentially bread and dates. Bread either made out of corn or wheat, sometimes barley, and dates. And... In Mauritania, I used to remember that during the date harvest, because the food was also very simple there, is that you used to really look for it. They used to call it Gaitana. And they used to actually, some teachers would go to where they have the date palms and set up there and teach their lessons there during the date harvest. And I remember eating so many dates that you get blisters on the inside of your mouth. right? And if you've ever been in a desert situation where you're not getting a lot of sugar, and you don't have a lot of sweet or savory types of food, that dates are delicious, and they really spice things up. So you can imagine the way that someone's waiting for the date harvest. They're eating very simply, and then the date harvest happens, and they're having these delicious, ripe, and then eventually that dry dates. And so they, he said that, I found the people in the barzakh waiting for you, the way that these people wait for the date harvest. The meaning there being is, there's certain people, is that when they transition into the next world, the Nabiyyin and the Siddiqin, the Shuddha and the Sadiqin are waiting for them, that with joy and longing. Now what kind of individual is that? That's how you and I want to live. That's the legacy that we want to be a part of. We want to live in a way now. Who cares about all these different rewards and awards and things that we can get here in this world? And the titles that we're given and the distinctions, that we, none of that matters if it's not for the sake of Allah. And all of these, none of that matters. What we want is that to become beloved to Allah and then Allah to command the angels and then naturally all of those who are beloved to Allah will love you if you're beloved to Allah. And imagine the state of that individual. You and I are living 1,400 plus years after in the craziness of this world in which we live. Just think of how crazy this world is. And that when you die, they're waiting there. And there's even another vision someone had about Sayyidina Fogi where there was a procession. And one of the ways that in some Mawada they speak about the Prophet says the Arus al Khafiqain. Right? The Khafiqain from the east to the west. The Arus is the one who's getting married. In other words, is that he's the one that everybody is looking at. And so the Arus al Khafiqain is just imagine, like in the procession, when someone's getting married, right, the groom comes in. In some cultures, like in Palestine, they have what's called the Zaffa. You come in and everybody's looking at who? They're looking at the groom. He's the center of attention and he's dressed, you know, very nicely and he's wearing traditions, traditional clothes and all that, right? And that imagine in the Barzakh is that there's certain people, that's how it is is that they are the ones that everybody has come together to celebrate the way that they lived here in this world. Allah, if we could live like that, if we could even have just a taste of that reality, what it would be like? To, and this is what, Every time we recite this verse, and rather every time we recite, that should be our intention. Is it solely for the sake of Allah that we want to be from the elect of those that Allah has bestowed His favor upon such that when we transition from this world, we'll fully detach. We don't want to remain here anyway other than to do what it is that we can do while we're here so that we can experience that in the hereafter. And then if someone experiences that, Ya Allah, 
There is no tongue that can possibly express how great that reality would be. Let's take a 15-minute break, inshallah ta'ala. May Allah ta'ala give us tawfiq and bless us in all of our affairs and make these realities firmly rooted in us. Ya Rahman Rahmin. We'll start to move along in the slides in the next session, inshallah ta'ala. And if you have any questions, please write them down. We'll give 10 minutes in the, in the beginning of next session to field the questions. Uh, and uh, inshallah ta'ala, we'll proceed further. Barakallahu feekum. Okay, so we can uh, open up the floor if there's any questions on anything that we've discussed uh, thus far. Assalamu alaikum. My question is, um, which is more important for uh, young Muslims to learn? The ilm of the zahir, like learning tafsir or hadith, um, or the ilm of the batin, learning uh, spiritual sciences? Yeah. So uh, the question is, is that which is uh, more important for a young Muslim to learn, the uh, outward sciences or the inward sciences? And the reality is, is that they're both important. Uh, so they're not mutually exclusive. You don't learn one at the expense of the other, right? And so that we learn uh, the outward sciences and the inward sciences together, and then we've done the very best that we can to that be the way that we need to be. And as Imam uh, that uh, Madik famously said, "Fakad tahakkak." If we join between the outward sciences and the inward sciences, is that this is the true way that a believer should be? Is between joining between the two. So I would uh, I would be on both fronts simultaneously, and that's traditionally how it was taught, right? And um, ultimately, when we think about the time of our Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam, is that all knowledge was taken from him. And it's only later that we think about um, these different distinctions of outward and inward and so forth. And ideally, is that we're getting everything at once. And, um, and it might have to be studied in slightly different places in different ways, but collectively, is that they all are playing their role. And so I would personally be on both fronts at the same time. Yeah. And then the way that this works is even the outward sciences is that they're impacting you directly inwardly. So there's an inward dimension even to the outward sciences. And uh, Sister, did you have a question? Um, I have a question about the part about oh, uh, the, par the part about oh, Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam say that you are a man. Could you elaborate on that one? Because there seems to be, um, you know. I don't know if there's like a mistranslation. There's like there's an inner meaning of that verse as well. That Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam was more than just a man. He was, right. and so why was that? What's so he was a man, of, yes. but he's not like other men. In other words, he was a human being. He was of human form. He was of the gens or the genus of human beings. But what is meant was is that he's the most special of human beings, and so that. Um, that prophets are human beings. They're males, they're human beings. But they're not like other human beings in the sense that they receive revelation. So they're, there's what's called istifa. They've been chosen by Allah to receive revelation. And that's really the point, is that um, sometimes people place so much focus on the human side of the Prophet it's almost as if he was just like us, and he wasn't just like us. He was just like us in terms of his human form. But he received revelation, so that internally what he received from Allah, his station with Allah, and this is further thought of as when you think of that when the Prophet ﷺ spoke, it wasn't like someone else speaking. When he would say something, it would become legislation until Yom Qiyamah. And that's indicated in the hadith where a man came to him and asked him about the pilgrimage, if it was an obligation every single year. And then he turned away from him, he came from his other side and came to him from a third side, asking him the same question. And finally the Prophet looked at him and said that, May Allah have mercy upon you, were I to have said yes, i.e. that it's an obligation every year, it would have become an obligation. So meaning his words were not like our words. I could say yes, and it didn't mean the same thing, but he was so beloved to Allah that when he spoke, what he says becomes legislation until Yom Qiyamah. That's really what's, uh, what's meant by that. Not that there was, uh, and he was a human being like us, Salah, I said about, uh, uh, that his words were not like our words, his acts were not like our acts. If that makes sense? Yeah.
But please feel free. I want everybody, this is your opportunity. I encourage you to ask questions. Even if we took half of the day speaking uh, and having discussion and, and answering questions, it's worth it. This is an opportunity. If something that crosses your mind and you want to, uh, to ask it, now is the time to do so. Uh, and Meaning that we don't do it all right now in this first 10 minutes of the second class, but yeah, in the time that we have together today, inshallah. So we'll come here and then we'll come back to you, inshallah, because you have the mic. Okay, so I'll turn it around. Sure, so the question is about the questioning in the grave. There's multiple narrations about the various questions that we are asked. And is there an ultimate response? The main thing is, is that the questions are going to center around our belief in Allah, the Prophet, and our deen. Those are the most important questions that we can prepare. In other words, is that the stronger our belief in, this, in Allah and in the Prophet, and the more we come to know Allah and know the Prophet, the more we know about our deen and the more that we put our deen into practice, the more positioned that we're going to be to answer the questions. So whatever the exact questions are when we return is that that's what we want to spend our life doing. And that again, the more we know Allah, the more we know the Prophet, the more we know our deen and that put it into practice, then the more we're going to be able to answer those questions. And, and ultimately what we need is for Allah to give us thabat. Right? Allah that makes the people who believe firm with the qawlith thabat, the firm word. In this world and the hereafter. And this is the We do our part to do everything I just mentioned. But ultimately we recognize there's no way for us to respond to those questions without Allah making us firm. And I remember that uh, years ago learning this from uh, Sheikh Hamza where you know that people even in a very outward sense sometimes when they have like a very big test that they're going to take that they go mind blank. You know, you've studied, 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 and it's possible that in the moment, you just go mind blank because of the uh, immensity of, of the moment. And um, in, in this reality, just when we hear these descriptions of that seeing these two angels that will come to us and ask us these questions, without the help of Allah, there's no way. So all we can do is do what was mentioned, rely upon Allah, and then Allah will make us firm. So that we answer those questions in uh, the way that is pleasing to him, subhanahu wa ta'ala. So, um, I just want to check because it makes it a little easier for me what you mentioned about a man, but not like other humans. Um, similarly, I'm thinking it makes it easier for me to understand, and I just wanted to check that. Um, like Hazrat Isa was a human being too, but unlike any other human being. Is that thinking correct or not? So in general, the example you gave of prophets, right, is that they are human beings. However, they have special qualities. And in particular, their most special quality is that they receive revelation. So only prophets can receive revelation. And so that means they're like other hu human beings insofar as they have physical bodies that they share with many other things that human beings share in, but internally that they have an ability to receive revelation. No other human being has that ability. And so that if you look at in the end of Surah Al-Hashr, لو أنزلنا هذا القرآن where we to have revealed this Qur'an to a mountain لَرَأِيْتُ خَاشِعًا مُتَصَدِّعًا مِنْ خَشَّةِ اللَّهِ You would have seen it in awe and <clears throat> fearful and that uh, split that asunder from the fear of Allah. In other words, is that Allah tells us that were the Quran to have been revealed to a mountain, it would have pulverized it. But the hearts of the prophets received that. But so that's what's really meant is that they have an ability to receive what other human beings do not have an ability to receive. So they're human beings, but they're not like other human beings in that they have an ability to receive revelation. And then there's a long list of special qualities that they have. There's a new book that's been published. I recommend that everybody gets a copy of it. There's actually two books I recommend. Because when we talk about knowing the Messenger of Allah, these two books are very important and helpful. And you can find them both on the uh, Imam al-Ghazali Institute website. They're based in New York. 
And um, the first is a translation of the Shamal at Tarmidi. And this translation is excellent and it includes very good notes in the margin. And um, this is an excellent book to have on everybody's shelf and to be read. And then they also recently published a book on the Hasayas, the special qualities of the Prophet Sisa. It has a red that uh, cover. And I would highly recommend everybody gets a copy. It's actually three different works. One is a work uh, on Mundhadr al-Labi by Imam Asyuti. And then there's a book by Imam Izzadin Abd al-Salam. And then they translate uh, and comment on many of the names of the Prophet I think that are taken from Dalai al-Khairat. So it's actually three books in one. And this will open one up to this, this meaning of what are called khasayas, special qualities of the Prophet. So the Prophet had qualities وسلم, that even other Prophets didn't have. And then the Prophets oftentimes had qualities that even beyond Revelation that other human beings didn't have. And, and this is really what is meant. And the purpose of us knowing those unique qualities of our Prophet وسلم, this is where this is really right at the, the crux of the matter is that knowing how special the Prophet is and what he's received enables you and I to take what he's giving us more seriously and to put it into practice. The ultimate goal is to know Allah. We're not, meant, we're not ever worshipping the Prophet, we're only worshipping Allah. But he is the means. But by loving him, by connecting to him, this helps us put his teachings into practice to ultimately come close to Allah. And so then when we're close to the Prophet, we're actually close to Allah. And that's what's so amazing about this. And so that, and ultimately we only love the Prophet because Allah commanded us to love the Prophet And because he's the most beloved of all of creation to Allah. So part of faith is we love what Allah loves and therefore we love the Prophet more than anyone and everything else other than Allah. So it's very clear. Very straightforward. So yes, I think that's one way of, 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 of making sense of it, yes. yeah. But that's the whole purpose of this. And again, to get back to this point, is that if you look at the companions and what they were able to do, all of that stemmed from their relationship with the Prophet They understood is that the Prophet was the messenger of Allah. They understood what that meant. And then look what it enabled them to do by embodying his in teachings and then taking them to the world as a result. And this is part of what we're trying to not just hint at, explicitly say. If we try to separate from our understanding and practice of Islam, the connection to the Prophet that we're all supposed to have is that we're going to make grave mistakes it's going to lead to a mistake at the level of conception, and then it's going to make an, we're going to make mistakes at the level of practice and action. So again, this gets back to the two archetypes we spoke about. In order for anything to be valid, accepted, and then you could say beneficial in the true sense of the word, word is that you have to have the correct conception. You have to know what it is that you're doing. And then based upon that correct conception, then is that what you have to do has to be right. So there's numerous examples that you can mention there, but I'll just give a random example just to kind of bring this point home. So at the level of conception, let's just say someone, as many people in our world actually do, they say, okay, the world in which we live can only sustain one point however many billion people. Well now, there's well over seven. Has it reached the eight billion point now? Can someone Google real quick? Has it reached the eight billion point? Maybe it has now. You gotta keep checking. But let's just say that, okay, it's reached eight billion. So we're way overly populated. So someone, their conception is the world can only hold one point something billion people. And so we have over 8 billion people, so we're in a crisis. That if someone puts that out there, what are their underlying assumptions? One is, their underlying assumption is, there's a particular way that we have to live that being modern people. 
that requires a certain amount of energy use and so forth and so on. Right? Another underlying assumption is, is that believing that there's limited resources. Other underlying assumption is, is that certain givens about human nature, that human beings will always tend to do certain things in a competitive world, that we have to get down to the bottom of that conception, question the underlying assumptions. And for us, in all three of those areas, and there might be more things, I'm just randomly bringing this up off the top of my head, is that when you put all of those things into question, you find that we see things very differently. So what might lead some people to say, then as a result of this, we need to control the population. And these Muslims, they keep having so many kids. right? I remember growing up, like before I became Muslim, and uh, it was usually in our circles, like the Mormons used to have all the kids, right? And it was just like this common trope of like people like, oh, these Mormons are having so many kids, right? Almost like it's like irresponsible. Like, what are you doing to the planet, right? And then Muslims, there's that sense, like they're just having so many kids. And then there's almost like, you know, they're like animals, like they don't know how to control themselves. And this type. There's all these other things where it's, unfortunately, you'd be surprised, like, you know, but then you all of a sudden learn about these statistics of like how that certain peoples, if we're going to use the word race, are dying. And that they've done studies on this. And I, I forget what it is. If it reaches below 1.4 in terms of the average amount of people that have them, that it's irreversible. And so literally you have dying populations. And then these other, this other redefining of gender altogether is not going to that help with those statistics. But the point here is, is that, um, no, tazawwaju, right? Al-walud, al-walud, al-wadud. Fa'inni mukathiru bikum an umun yamu qiyamah. Our Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi encouraged us to have children and to the, uh, have the people that he's going to boast about them on the Day of Judgment. That doesn't stop that all of a sudden, because moderns believe that there's not enough resources, that we don't subscribe to a view of limited resources. We know that no matter how many people are on the planet, if we're living principally, there always will be enough. And so there's, we have to question those underlines. So my point is, if you get the conception wrong, then it might lead you to getting, it will lead you to getting everything else wrong. You can't get anything right if you don't have the right conception. So when it comes to everything, you've got to have the right conception. And this is other words, is that you could say, this is where everywhere in the Quran where Allah points to belief and practice. Those who believe and do righteous deeds. This combination of the two. This is essential. So we have to get this right at the level of conception. Understanding who our Prophet is, how our relationship to him should be. This is essential because all of the details that we learn after that are built upon this. And the attempt here is, is to just look at certain verses of the Quran that teach us how to view the Prophet and then how we can then take from his various religious teachings. And I'm hoping at some point to follow up with a detailed study of the companions themselves and illustrate time and time again how it is that they viewed the best of creation, وسلم, how intent they were to convey his message. There's this, it really struck me, we did a reading of Sunan al-Tirmidhi, and there was one companion who said, Ramaktu Rasulullah وسلم, shahra. I watched the Prophet closely for an entire month. Look at how they were. This is the way they were. They knew who he was. So in other words, he spent an entire month watching the Prophet closely. So when they came into his presence, they weren't just looking at him. They were looking at him. They were really, they saw him as the source of guidance. And then the hadith goes on to say is that he used to recite in the two rakats before Fajr, قُلْ يَا أَيُّهُ الْكَافِرُونَ إِنْ سُورْتِ الْخَلَاسِ and imagine everything else, that this is just the narration we have. Imagine everything else that he observed in that time where for an entire month he was observing the Prophet very closely. That's how these people were. Because they understood this meaning, مَنْ يُتِئِ اللَّهَ وَرَسُولُ Whoever obeys Allah and his measure, they understood what that meant. And they understood that the Prophet, everything that he did was a teaching moment. 
And when they read a hadith like, إِنَّمَا بُعِثْتُ مُعَلِّمًا I have only been sent as a teacher. They didn't understand that in just a very general way, is that our Prophet came as a teacher. They understood that every haraka and every elda harakat and sakinat, every moment of movement, every moment of stillness, when our Prophet spoke, when he didn't speak, what he spoke about and what he didn't speak about, how his face looked, how he responded to certain situations, what he did by night, what he did by day, everything they saw as a moment of learning. That's how they were in relation to the Prophet Every single moment was important. And um, again, this is standard. This is not, um, this is not excessive. This is standard. This is how it should be. And so what I'm trying to encourage is that attitude that we all develop in understanding of the Prophet that allows us to cultivate this relationship with you, and we're going to end at the end of the day with practical ways of doing that. But then also, as we embark upon the study of his deen, and we learn the science of aqidah, we learn the science of fiqh, we learn the science of tasawwuf, which are the essential pieces of knowledge that we need to know. Our deen is so amazing. It's so amazing. It really is. And think about the fardain, the individual obligations. This is the knowledge that is the essential knowledge in the Quran and the Sunnah that everybody has to know. So in other words, if you want to summarize what you need to know from Kitab Allah and from the Sunnah of the Messenger of Allah, it's all in the Fardain. And it can be taught in its most basic way in two hours. And then you can expand and go a little bit further. And you can expand and go a little bit further. And this is what Imam al-Ghazali mentions in his book called Jawahir al-Qur'an, The Jewels of the Qur'an, where initially what became the Arba'in al-Asl, the 40 foundations, was supposed to be that a part of Jawahir al-Qur'an, this is what he says, is that this knowledge that I'm presenting to you, which is essentially the knowledge of Iman, Islam, and Ihsan, this is, if you act upon it, you're acting upon the essence of what is in the Qur'an and the Sunnah of our Messenger, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. What a blessing. How many of us are ever going to read Sahih Bukhari? let alone the other that five canonical collections. And these are just the major ones. The Muslim name of Ahmed is over 30,000 hadith. And that any real muhaddith is working with 900 plus collections of a hadith. And that some have pointed to individual narrations of being that in the realm of 47 or 67,000 total, not including the muqarrarat and the different versions and the different that narrations of them. There's a lot out there. If we were required to do it in of ourselves, we would not be able to do so. So what a blessing is that we can learn our deen in the most basic way. If you believe in La ilaha illallah Muhammad Rasulullah, you are a believer. And that's what happened really for people in my own family, is that they thought that if I don't put all of the individual rules into practice, I'm not a Muslim. And no, anyone who believes in one God and they believe that the Prophet is a Prophet, they're Muslim. And there's actually quite a few people out there that don't even know they're Muslim, they're actually Muslim. And this is the type of doubt that actually really works, like, man, you're already Muslim. Like, whether you realize that, you are already Muslim. And all you have to do is just simply say, Ashadu an la ilaha illa wa shalom Rasulullah. And everything else comes after that. And even if someone only said it one time in their life, ever, they're saved. And our Prophet will come to rescue them if they actually end up in hell. May Allah protect us himself and take them into paradise. For those that said, La ilaha illallah, one time. And um, the shahada is great with Allah wa ta'ala. So, um, let's uh, move on here, bismillah. So if we look at the next slide, I can't really see it that well. Does that say witness as well? These are just other examples of this ma'a, this particle, that can be translated as be with, or this idea of witness or togetherness. And to show that just how you and I should be moved by this. This witness is creating this condition of the heart where you long for your beloved, where you want to be with them, where you understand that from our deen is to desire to be close to these people and to have a connection with them.
And this is one of the greatest things of all that we can cultivate in our own hearts and the hearts of our children. And of all things that will protect your children and help them navigate the difficulties of our time, nothing is greater than this meaning. Nurturing in them from the beginning of their life the love of Allah and the messenger of Allah, the family of the Prophet وسلم, and the righteous. Nothing will protect them more than that. And then after that, knowledge. Knowledge is secondary to this reality. And knowledge is of the utmost, utmost extreme importance. But before knowledge is the connection of the heart to these people. Rear your children, nurture your own heart first, and then nurture this in them. Nothing will protect them more from the evil influences of any time, but especially in the Dajjalic world at the end of time, than this reality. And then you add to that as well, that knowledge, grounding them in their deen, so they can see through a lot of this nonsense that is out there. This is what we're being called to. Ya amanu. O you who believe, Allah is speaking to the people who believe in who? In Him. Ittaqullah. That have taqwa of Allah wa kunu ma'asadikin and be with the sadikin. And the scholars here say Allah did not say kunu minasadikin. Be from the sadikin, which we're supposed to be, is that be with them. Because what happens? When you're with them, this is what happens. And this is the other secret here about connection. When your heart is attached to these people, and you love the Prophet, you love the Siddiqeen and the Shuhada and the Salihin, what ends up happening is that that love is an elixir that molds your heart to be like them. By virtue of the love, even if you don't put much energy in to help the process, but especially if you put energy in to help the process, you become like them. When your heart is attached to them, and then outwardly you try your best to be like them, and this is the goal is to mold yourself to the Sunnah of the Prophet And ultimate felicity, and that gazing upon the noble conscience perpetually, is just simply to mold yourself to the Rasulullah. If you do that, you'll attain the greatest thing in this world and the hereafter. And to the degree, some of us are molded this way, where there's degrees to which we're molded, and that we're aligned. But the secret is to be aligned. And this is why these two fronts of the internal connection combined with the outward effort we put in is it what helps this process take place. And so that these are very powerful aspects of our deen. And people that understand these meanings, you'll find these are the people that are firm. These are the people that are firm. And we can go into a whole tangent here is that people that have a methodology in life and they understand the minhaj of the Qur'an and the Sunnah, the methodology of the Qur'an and the Sunnah. And then by extension, the way that that is interpreted and expressed by the great inheritors of the prophets in every generation is that when you adhere to a particular methodology that protects you from confusion, that protects you from doing what you shouldn't do in times where things are ambiguous, that helps you understand what it means to specifically put into context various verses of the Quran and Hadith of our Messenger وسلم, in any given time. Because even groups that have gone astray, they've almost always gone astray with misinterpreting that various verses in the Quran or Hadith of our Prophet or cherry-picking certain verses and decontextualizing, not understanding it in light of other verses in the Quran and other Hadith of our Prophet And so this is why we need a methodology. And this is one of the quintessential traits of Ahlul Sunnah wa Jama'ah is that they have that created a coherent way of interpreting the essential sources of our religion and have passed it down throughout the generations. This is what we connect to when we learn from these various scholarly methodologies. So we need minhajiyah, we need a methodology in life that we can cling to and live by and know in any given circumstance, okay, what should I do?
in the moment it's so tempting sometimes to jump on board with what so many other people are doing and that sometimes it's not a matter of being fully right or fully wrong there's shades of gray in this but people that have a methodology resist that temptation that they know is that while we have to respond in the moment at times to various things we also have to think long term and that this is what this methodology is going to ensure is that what happens before these events during these events and after these events is that we've thought everything through we resist the urge of solely responding in the moment so here this is another call to witness and then we have other examples that look in, for instance, Surah Al-Hud, that we see this, that what does Allah Ta'ala say? amanu ma'hu, In relation to the Prophet Hud, who believed in those who believed with him. In relation to the Prophet Salih, وَلَذِينَ amanu ma'hu, In those who believed with him. And then in relation to our Prophet Muhammadun Rasulullah, وَلَذِينَ ma'hu. These meanings move the hearts of the righteous. Muhammad is the Messenger of Allah in those who are with him. This is how they are. What is there? A shidda wal al kuffar. They are firm with the disbelievers. Now that doesn't mean that at work, like I've been commanded to be firm with the disbelievers. And you are a disbeliever. So I'm going to be firm with you. I'm not going to smile at you. I'm going to be rude to you, in fact. That's not what it means. The primary definition here is, is that we do not let the kufr of the kafir, the disbelief of a disbeliever, seep into our understanding and clarity that we have in this religion. Nor do we let the acts that a person, of, that a disbeliever does, get confuse us to think that this is something that we should do. We have clarity. A shiddat, we're firm. Is that we are nice, we're kind, we're polite, and we're people that call people to Islam. In any opportunity that we have to call people to Islam at work, in the street, at the grocery store, wherever, we must. First and foremost with our state, secondly with our words. But we don't let people sway us from our religion. We're people of principle. Is that even if people are acting however it is that they're acting, we are firm. And we remain principled under all circumstances. This is the essential meaning, as I've learned directly from our teachers, kufari. that's what it means. And there are various times is that when people are trying to harm us too, that we're firm, outwardly. And that doesn't just apply to disbelievers, that applies to believers. If a believer is trying to hurt us, we don't like, oh, hey, brother, come hurt me, right? No, you can defend yourself. And in fact, there's a hadith that says, man... Whoever dies trying to defend his wealth is a shaheed. That person has the reward of a martyr. And if someone comes to you and they're holding you at gunpoint and they're asking you for your purse or your wallet, is that in Shira you have one of two choices. You can either give it to them, it's permissible, or you could fight back. And if you die fighting back, you're a shaheed. Now I'm not encouraging one or the other. That's left to you to figure out what it is that you want to do. But were someone to fight back, that they have the right to, you don't have to just hand someone over your wealth, you could fight back. And if you die, you're a shaheed. And you might feel that, okay, it's better for me just to hand it over. I don't really have any too much in there, take it. Right? That's, but you can fight back if someone is that trying to attack you. And so this also is a very other important point, is that there is a common misunderstanding that good character always means that we're nice and we're not firm. That's not the case. There's times that we have to be firm. And these are other conversations. But then ruhama'u bainahum They are merciful and compassionate with one another. And so this description is for the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and those that are with him. In other words, the Prophet taught them how to be this, but to be this way, but from the blessing of this witness. And what else does the word sahaba mean? Companionship. Taking spending time with them. When Allah Ta'ala says, Kama arsana fikum, Rasulan minkum. Look at how many times in this particular verse Allah says, Kum. You. 
meaning this is for you. Kama arsana fikum, just as we have sent among you, Rasulan minkum, a messenger from among you. Yatlu alaykum, that's three times so far. He recites to you, ayatina wa yuzakikum, and he purifies you, another kum. Wa yu'allimukum, yet another kum. Al kitaba wal hikmata wa yu'allimukum, a six kum. Ma'alam dakunu ta'lamun. And um, that he teaches you that that which uh, that he uh, that you previously did not know, and so the meaning here is is that uh, that this first bit yet to do alaykum, he recites to you, and the meaning of this is is that when you, in order for that, to, to in order to to really experience that, you have to be in the Prophet and hearing him that teach them the meanings of the book, reciting the Qur'an to them in prayer and outside of prayer, on the pulpit, in the circles of learning and so forth, and every other teaching situation where the Prophet is that quoting or reciting or reading the Qur'an. So in other words, what this means is, is that the oral transmission comes first. The talaqi, the personal instruction that we receive, comes first. This is if we don't get this right, there's no way for us to be successful as a community that in America or anywhere else ever, in any age, in any geographical location. In other words, is that the most important thing that we need in any given time, in any geographical location, are living representatives that are inheritors of the Prophet that can teach us our religion in person with companionship, spending time. Everybody needs this. The internet is a band-aid. We should still use it for good purpose, but it is not a replacement. It's dangerous if it becomes a replacement, let alone that if we that open up a door for bad use of the internet. It has to be good principled use, and it can be used as a supplement, and in places where people do not have local scholars, is that it's a band-aid. But it is not a replacement. And until you and I have that multiple people in every major and minor, large and small, and even in rural areas, that cities in the United States of America, representatives of the Prophet that are teaching us this religion, we're not going to ever get far. We're going to remain in darkness. Because if you just think about your own self, and if you've had opportunities of being with good people, it takes time. It takes time. And when you have these transformative moments with the great inheritors, you never forget them. They're the greatest moments of life. And anyone who's become successful has almost always, with the, only the rarest of exceptions, it's not the case, they've been affected by good people, even in the dunya. So this is something that has to become a staple part of how we view the deen, where we need to interact. And there are some people who just don't want to do work with the youth, don't want to... What we encourage with the work we're doing in Maqasid, we have that programs for daycare students from age 2 to 5. We have a madrasa for students from age 6 to 11. We now have an academy for students that are from ages like 12 to 17 or 18. Then we have a seminary that primarily serves 18 years and older. But all of our teachers, we encourage to teach all of the different age groups. And personally, I find it just as fulfilling. It's not about being fulfilling. It's about doing what's right. It's just as important to interact with a two-year-old as it is an 18-year-old. It's just as important to interact with a 14-year-old as it is with someone who's 50 years old. It's just as important. Every opportunity is an opportunity to plant a seed of the prophetic inheritance in that individual. And usually two-year-olds don't argue with you either, right? They just absorb it. And you would be surprised what is possible if we do things right. And we need community to do this. The Bay Area knows about microclimates. This is the place of microclimates. If you have a microclimate of faith, given the hostile macroclimate of this oasis desert that, uh, yeah, I mean, dry, that space of, of kufr and disbelief, 
is that you can nurture the, your children, but you have to come together as a community. And alhamdulillah, there's a lot of people who have done this, and there's a lot of good happening in places like the Barrier and other places in the United States of America. And it's totally possible. And I've seen examples, especially in places, I'm thinking of one in particular in New Jersey, where I know a friend who's a teacher who spends a lot of time with the youth. And I've seen before my eyes tens of people end up in college fully balanced. They have a career track. They're thinking straight. They're mature. And they're almost unaffected by all this nonsense that is taking place in the world. But it's because they have suhbah. They spend time with this teacher. He's there with them. He's doing activities with them. He's answering their questions. He's helping them through their difficult times. He's giving them advice on career, on marriage, on friendships. This is what we need. We need people that we can go to. But there's so many people in the community, this is why we need so many of these people. That one person is not enough. There's only so much that one person can do. There's only so many appointments that you can have in a week. That even doctors, there's only so many patients that they can fit into the 10 minute or whatever slots. And this is why we need more people. But if it became a priority for us as a community, and we're willing to support these endeavors even more so, that we're willing to sacrifice our, for ourselves and with our own children for them, this is when everything is going to change. But as long as that we are, for all intents and purposes, thinking that this whole educational process is something that is auxiliary for a few people, but yeah, Allah, at best I'm just going to support it and send a little bit of money for it. We're going to remain in the situation that we end. This is one of the most important things that we have to take these tangents for, is to convince our community of the importance of education. We shouldn't have to do that. We shouldn't have to take these tangents. We should all understand this. So anyhow, this is another example. Muhammad Rasulullah, ma'hu. Those that were with them, is that look at what happens to them as a result of being with them. They have the same traits as the Prophet ﷺ. They're firm with the disbelievers in the way that was mentioned. And they are merciful amongst themselves. Tarahum. Whom? Now because of their companionship and they're with them, they're all one. He, they, and the Prophet are one. They have the same traits. Ruk'a'in sujjadan. They're bowing and prostrating in prayer. Yabtahuna fadlan min Allah wa ridwana. Look at their traits. This is how they are. They are people that seek Allah's bounty and good pleasure. Imagine if you just implemented that one verse. You're a person that prays extensively. You're a person of prayer. Anytime you're bothered by something, you got news that you might get fired. Right? You rush to prayer. You got news that you lost a loved one. You rush to prayer. You got news that you just got some type of illness. You rush to prayer. This is the way they are. This is how they are. And they're people that their day is spent seeking the bounty of Allah. And there's an outward dimension of that, and there's a spiritual dimension of that. And His good pleasure. See ma'hu fi wujuhim. Is that the sign can be seen on their faces, that brightness. They know who they are. Min athir sujood. From the trace of prostrating in prayer. These people are special. They're like monks at night. They're people of devotion. And precisely because they're people of devotion, is that? What's that? Oh, did I not change the slide? And yet another one, but we won't go into that anymore. And yet another one. The point here is like, this is the Quran. How many verses do we need to read? Right? It's just, this is what the Quran is teaching us. And that's precisely what we're trying to get at here. The Prophet ﷺ is the straight path. So that when we ask Allah Ta'ala for the Surat al-Mustaqeem, is that the Surat al-Mustaqeem is a way of living, yes. It's a way of being. It's a methodology that we adhere to. It's taqwa. It's fulfilling certain commandments and avoiding certain prohibitions. But all of that was embodied in the Prophet ﷺ. All of that was taken from him. So this is why you have certain commentators that say, when Allah says, sirati mustaqim," And indeed, that is my path perfectly straight. 
Some of them interpret this verse as saying is that this hadha is innocent mishara referring to the Prophet Sallallahu So some would translate this as wa hadha and indeed that that or that he is my straight path, i.e. the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi That is a valid interpretation of that. Fattabi'uhu. So with this interpretation, so follow him, not follow it. And do not follow other ways, for they will lead you away from his way. And so, when we understand that, that takes on a whole new meaning. Is that the Prophet was the greatest example of the spiritual path. This is why scholars say, is that the greatest tafsir of the Quran is actually the life story of the Prophet Sallallahu his sirah. His sirah is the greatest tafsir because he is teaching us in every moment of his life the ideal way to put the divine address of the Quran into practice. And so imagine a tafsir that connects those dots of various instances and how in this particular instance the Prophet is putting this particular verse into practice. Now, that is a knowledge that Odia might be gifted that is not in books. And that knowledge could be inspired. Someone could re receive that knowledge by way of inspiration from the bounty of Allah to Barak wa Ta'ala. But I'm not aware of a tafsir that, that's the whole purpose of the tafsir is to point that out. Uh, that part of this presentation towards the end was to, sh to uh, mention some concrete examples of how various things that our Prophet said were directly taken from verses of the Qur'an and it's very clear because of the similarity in terms of what the Prophet is speaking about. But um, that I didn't get very far in preparing that, although there's multiple examples of that. Uh, but then some of them are not as clear. The ones that I chose were fairly easy because there's uh, similar things that our Prophet is referring to, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. So, he is the straight path. But then we're going to go a little bit further. He also, Sallallahu Alaihi is the firmest handhold. The Urwatil Wuthqa. So in Surat al-Baqarah, what does Allah say? فَمَنْ يَكْفُرْ بِالْتَاغُوتِ Whoever renounces false gods. Taghut are false deities. وَيُؤْمِنْ بِاللَّهِ And believes in Allah. فَقَدْ اسْتَمْثَكَ بَلْ أُرْوَتِ الْوُثْقَى has in certainly grasped the firmest, unfailing handhold. There's an extra space there after the handhold. And some of them say is that the Urwat al is the Prophet And what is meant by that is, and this is very important, and this is perhaps one of the greatest things that can be used to convince you or someone else about the importance of knowing our Prophet there is a lot of people that get very confused for various reasons. A class that they might have taken, that a question that they might have been asked that they're unable to respond. And they're unable to solicit an answer to that question. Or that something that they heard or learned about the religion, they're just trying to grasp and it doesn't make sense to them and so forth. Or so forth. In the end, there's an easy way for us to renew our faith and to preserve it. Even if you don't have the answer to that question or whatever, in the end, there's only one or two possibilities. Either the Prophet told the truth, or he didn't. Either what he's saying true, or is true, or it's not true. There's not a third possibility. You either believe in him, or you don't believe in him. And that not knowing whether or not you should believe in him is a type of not believing in him. It's very simple. You either believe in him, or you don't believe in him. And so once you understand that, the more that you come to know the Prophet him, you always have a safe haven and a refuge to go back to. I don't understand that particular theological issue, or I am trying to grasp on why this evil is happening in this world. I don't understand the wisdom behind it, or that that particular question that was posed, or that particular legal ruling, I don't fully understand how to understand that in light of what I know from the religion. But I'm going to go back to this safe space. I know for sure that the Prophet him, is telling the truth. It's a safe place for you to go back to. And that's why it's the Urwat al-Wuthqa. 
He's the firmest handhold. It will never break. It can't break. And that meaning is that there, and it, this is why it's so important, they come back to the Prophet And this is why is that you see examples of the companions. When they had difficulties understanding things, they would always go back to him. Because they knew he was, since he was telling the truth. They believed in that unequivocally, that they knew this 100% he was telling the truth. And they went back to him. And there were even times where they would have wasawas, whisperings of different sorts, questioning their faith, the companions themselves. And they would go back to the Prophet Salaam. And he would treat them. And that he would treat them at all three levels. He would treat them spiritually, and he would treat them emotionally, and he would treat them in relation to knowledge at the level of the mind. He would always treat people in every single way, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. But the light of his presence was supporting everything else that he did in relation to his emotional intelligence, if we're going to call it that. And the way he was dealing with people at a psychological and emotional level. But then also, is that the way he was outwardly and how he spoke to people and that what it is that he said. So this is that very important. And then, yet another that understanding. The Prophet also, according to some scholars, is the rope of Allah. And you'll have, and when it comes to these meanings, you'll have different opinions of, of scholars. And all of them are valid. But this is another invalid interpretation, is that he is the Hablullah al-Mateen. And it could also be the Qur'an. There's multiple interpretations. But when you understand this, you start to see the interrelated nature of this, on how that it's the Qur'an and it's also the Prophet It's the Hablullah of Allah. In other words, is that, you hold firmly onto him, but when you hold firmly onto him, you're holding firmly onto what he brought, which is the Quran, to his sunnah, all of the other meanings. They're all intertwined. But when people truly understand who the Prophet is, is that they'll start to understand how all these all other meanings are interconnected through him, if that makes sense. So some say. And hold firmly to the robot. And do not be divided. So then we have to bring up this issue of not seeing the Prophet. So everything that we've set up to now, we hope that someone's been convinced at this point. And this verse here is a verse that can be used to point to the reality that there are people that look at the Prophet. But they do not see him. Now this verse has more than one meaning, but this is one of the meanings. So Watarahum Yandarune Ilaik. And you, O Prophet, may see them facing towards you. But they cannot see. Okay, so one of the meanings of this is that referring in relation to how they saw the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And you may see them facing towards you. They're looking at you. But they do not see you. They're seeing you, but they're not seeing you. They're seeing you in terms of you're physically there, but you're not Rasulullah to them. You're the Yatim of Bani Hashim, the orphan from Bani Hashim. Is that you're this or you're that, or you're someone who, based upon their own polluted hearts, wants power, wants dominion, wants control, wants some material wealth of some sort. As all the different things that diseased souls that seek is that they have to that then project that on you. So there's a lot of people during his time that saw him, but they didn't see him. They were looking at him, but they did not see him. Whereas the companions looked at him, but they saw him. They knew who he was, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. There was no generation of people that ever that knew who the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam really was, like the companions. 
And they do mention, this is a latifa, this is a subtle, that these gems that you hear from your teachers. As they say, in the end of time, when Jesus, the son of Mary, comes back, because he shares with the Prophet Nubuwa and Risala, prophethood and messengership, is that he will be able to speak about the Prophet وسلم, in ways that no one else has spoken about that on earth. And no matter how much the companions or any of the inheritors came to know about the Prophet after him, they're limited because they don't share with him Nabuwa and Risala. Whereas Isa does. So he's going to be speaking about the Messenger of Allah وسلم, in ways that other people that don't realize have, not, have yet to speak about. And that's also another meaning, is that if you really think about the beauty of this, is that with all of these world conflicts, if Jesus was with us here right now, السلام, he would be on our side. If Moses was here right now, he would be on our side. He would be on our side against those who actually claim him, against those who actually claim him. That though were the Moses as an Imam to be like, Ma was your ill tibai, is that he would have no choice other than to follow me if he was alive. And when Isa comes back in the end of time, he doesn't judge with the hukum of the Injil, that he judges with the hukum of the Quran and of our Prophet. So this is very important. This verse points, one of this, not the only meaning of this verse, there's other meanings as well. This is one meaning that can be extrapolated from this, is that there are people that will see him, that look at him, but not see him. And what this indicates for us is, is that we need to be people who cultivate what is called a meshhad, a proper understanding, literally an outlook of our proper science, and a proper conception. And the scholars of the inward sciences have always said, al medit ala qadr mashhad. Now this can be applied even to anything that you do, athletics, your career, anything else. Is that you will only benefit from things to the extent that you see them as important. So I could have this a bill right here, right? It could be a dollar bill or it could be a thousand dollar bill. And if it was a thousand dollar bill, I'm looking at that, I'm like, oh, that's a thousand dollar bill. And so if I just saw a thousand dollar bill right here, what are you going to do with a thousand dollar bill? Right? Or just take the example of a check. It's one dollar and there are a hundred thousand dollars is written on this. It's a piece of paper. The young children are going to be like, oh, it's a piece of paper. <laughs> right? Put it in their mouth. It's a hundred thousand dollars. But it's, it's just a piece of paper. I'm going to scribble on it a little bit. You know what I mean? Draw something on it. It doesn't mean anything to them. They see the paper, but they don't understand the worth of that paper. Is that a check that's worth a hundred thousand right there? You could deposit have a hundred thousand dollars in your. How are you going to treat that? You're going to treat that very differently than it was a check for ten dollars or a hundred dollars. So, in other words, is that two people can see the same thing but see it very differently. And the more you understand the value of what it is that you see, the more that you will then respond in relation to that. If you have precious jewelry, you have things that are of great worth, you tend to protect them. You put more energy in to preserve them. And likewise, is that this is how it is in relation to our Prophet Sallallahu And the more we understand who he is, is that the more then we are positioning ourselves to benefit from him sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and then you could go into a plethora of verses we will just focus on a few a plethora of verses that indicate the people being veiled by the human side of our Prophet sallallahu and this can primarily refer to uh, that uh, disbelievers during his time, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, but by extension it could also potentially refer to people that are veiled by who our Prophet also is, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, and the various degrees of knowing who he is. So that if you look at this, وَقَالُوا مَا لِهَذَا الرَّسُولِ And they say mockingly, what kind of messenger is this? يَكُّلَ الطَّعَامُ وَيَمْشِي فِي He eats food and goes about in marketplaces for a living. Lola, 
unzila ilahi malakun fi yakunu ma'ahu nadira if only an angel had been sent down with him to be his co-warner aw yalqa ilayhi kanzun aw takun lahu jannatun ya'kulu minha or a treasure had been cast down to him or he had a garden through which he may eat wa qala al-zalimuna in tattabi'un ar-rajul al-mas'ura and the wrong do say to believe you are only following a bewitched man people done sihr on him khalas right look at how many times allah speaks about this in the quran this is very important and so many of our people to this day this is where we have to put our minds together and really think about how we want to present the prophet sallallahu to our people but before we do that first and foremost with our own actions but if we don't understand him correctly and we're not exemplifying his sunnah it's going to be limited what we can do in terms of talking about him is that yes we have to do that but first and foremost it has to be reflected in us and this is getting back to that timeless duty of the prophets and the messengers and their inheritors this is what they're meant to do to cultivate these meanings yatlu alaykum ayati wa yuzakkikum that reciting to you our signs or our revelations and purifying you that helping you transform live the realities of these teachings and then also that presenting to him by way of knowledge this is how our prophet was and this is the standard that we hold ourselves to such that when you see us falling short you know that's us and not him but this is the way that we should be this is essential and understanding in depth understanding the psyche of the people of the time in which we live what is preventing them from understanding prophethood and messengership what is preventing them from understanding the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam we have to do i'mal al fikr think very carefully how we as a community and can do things to change this perspective and to build bridges of understanding be means for this veil to be lifted from them so they can get beyond from just seeing this human side let alone a demonized version of who he was sallallahu alaihi wasallam and understanding who he truly is and in this regard i wholeheartedly believe is that we have to present the sunnah of our prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam unapologetically unabashedly in its entirety as it truly is and even if some things are a little bit uncomfortable for people to hear in the long run you're much more likely to win them over when you speak to him as he truly is for instance when you read and i remember shik samer saying this when we were studying sunan tarmidhi and it's a valuable point he feels that it's actually better and this is not taking from the genre of shamail of learning about the prophet's characteristics so and he says is that the greatest way to learn about the prophet sai salam is also to study that all the different the aspects of his life as is presented in a comprehensive book like the jami sahih al bukhari or the sunan of at tirmidhi and that you learn so much about him you learn about him in his aspects of jamal and you learn about him in his aspects of jalal and when you present it right as opposed to in a very that apologetic sense of wanting people to accept that the prophet says and fit them into their own narrow lens which has been affected by modernity that no really presenting him as he really is in talking about the wisdom in that yes his name he's the nabil malahim he's the prophet of battles and that famous he's the nabi al rahma that's how it starts he's the prophet of mercy and he's the nabi at toba and he's the prophet of uh, of repentance but he's also the nabi al malah he's the prophet of battles and no one fought more just wars that were sanctioned by allah solely for his sake than he did sallallahu alaihi wasallam sacrificing everything and no one was more upright in just in moral even in the heat of the battle than he was sallallahu alaihi wasallam and after the battle and then how he treated prisoners sallallahu alaihi wasallam and then the ahkam that he left behind that regulate warfare so actually what people shy away from is actually a proof of who he is and people that know the way that the world really works and that there are times that you need to use force that are not going to be drawn towards islam if you don't present the prophet in his entirety the people really know that if you do and show is that they will see that his understanding and what he was given by Allah is superior and then everything else takes its place 
We are not people of war. But we are people that we want peace. We do not resort to war unless we absolutely have to. And because our Prophet is mutakhalik bi akhlaqillah, and we know that the mercy of Allah has outstripped his wrath, the default position of the Prophet is he was mercy. And he only moved to a firm response to the extent that it was needed based upon the people or peoples that were before him. Otherwise, the def default position is Rahmah. So whose fault is that? That's their fault, not his. He was doing what he was commanded to do. And even in some of those firm stances that he took, they were all embedded with mercy. In reality, were someone to actually see. So, there's a lot of thought we have to do here in a very strategic way. How are we presenting the Messenger of Allah to our people? And what are the creative ways that we can really get down to the nitty degree and to affect that many of these frames of thinking that people have and the ideas that they have in relation to these core aspects of our deen? And then that to speak to people at different levels, more intellectuals and well-read people, you're going to speak to them differently than people on the street and find out various techniques that different people, based upon what they're able to do, can that reach out to people in different ways and present our messenger. This is of the utmost, utmost importance. And I think we need to stop for prayer here very soon, so we'll end on this slide. Does that say the Prophet's human side? So, what is the correct way then to understand the human side of our Prophet And I've learned this directly from our teachers. Is that the Prophet's human side is a door to understand his spiritual, his special nature. Not the opposite. That the, some people think of the Prophet's human side in a way that limits their understanding of his special nature. It's a door to it. And this is evidenced by this verse in Surah Al-Kahf that you see all before you, that we've already quoted. Say, O Prophet, I am only a man like you, you Ha'ile, but it has been revealed to me. I receive revelation. Indeed, that your Lord is only one God. And so in other words, is that this is the progression that the Quran is teaching us. The scholars of Shamal spoke about the physical characteristics of the Prophet because he was the most complete, perfect, and beautiful human being of all, even in relation to his physical stature. From the way that his bones were, from the way that his flesh was, from the way that his physical features were. This is why that they mention it. Everything about the Prophet even in relation to his physical form, reached the pinnacle. He was the most beautiful human being ever. And Yusuf was given half of beauty, but the Prophet was given all of beauty. And here they say that were he not to have been clothed with majesty, is that what happened to Joseph, i.e., is that they ended up cutting their wrists because of his overwhelming angelic beauty, is that that would have happened in relation to the Prophet, but his beauty was clothed with Jalal. And so, from a distance, people were in awe of him, but when they got close to him, oh, they fell in love with him. That's one of the most beautiful descriptions of of all of the seer, which is summarizes what happens when people enter into the prophetic preference. Look at the way this is even described. Whoever mixes with him such that they come to know him. And they were up close then in his presence, seeing his interactions, seeing how he dealt with people, seeing how he carried himself, feeling what's happening to their heart when they're with him. What happens? They came to love him. That's what happens. And that's naturally what will happen if we present to the Prophet, to our people, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, first and foremost with our own states, and then that also in relation to that knowledge of how he was. This is what will happen. And if that doesn't happen, there's one of two things happening. Either we're not living up to how he is, or we don't have correct knowledge to present him as he truly is, or is that they are veiling themselves with their own ego and their preconceived notions. But any human being, naturally, by virtue of their fitrah, if they didn't have any barriers, would come to love the Prophet when they came into his presence. But if they had that uh, arrogance or that they had 
that uh, alter your motives, and that if they have other diseases of the heart, envy, or other things of this nature, then they block themselves from the light. The ego blocks the light. The light is shining. We block ourselves from the light by virtue of the ego, because the ego is dense. And it is a hijab that is kathif, that is thick. It blocks the light. And so, the human side of the Prophet Sallallahu is a door to know his special nature. So understanding his physical characteristics, his humanity, and then leads to a knowledge of his character and all of his blessed traits of how he is in relation to but, uh, that dimension of him. And then leads to a knowledge of that his special quality, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. That's how we should view this, inshallah ta'ala. We can stop there and uh, go from here to that session, what is supposed to be session two. We kind of combined, uh, made session one kind of long. Uh, into the special qualities of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi That Let's break, because I think we pray at 1.30, is that correct? So that uh, we can freshen up, get ready for prayer. And again, if there are any uh, questions anyone has, is it, write them down and uh, we'll do our best to get to any and all questions that people have. Barakallahu feekum. May Allah ta'ala give us to feekum, bless us in all of our affairs. And to give us knowledge of this religion, Ya Rahman Rahmin. And to worship Him in a way that is pleasing to Him. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala give us openings at all levels. Openings level of that our intellects and minds and openings at level, Ya Rahman Rahmin. <coughs> of worship and openings at the spiritual level, Ya Rahman Rahim. May Allah protect us and preserve us and make faith firm in our hearts, Ya Allah. And to build our spiritual music system such that we develop resilience and have an ability, Ya Allah, Ya Rahman Rahim, to experience difficulties but to remain firm upon this path, Ya Allah. Wa sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, wa wa alayhi wa sallam, wa sallam, wa sallam, wa sallam, wa sallam, wa sallam, wa Okay, Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. So inshallah we can uh, start just to take a few minutes if there's any questions that anyone has on any of the uh, previous sessions mm. because that they they because of how special those people are right so if, when someone becomes beloved to Allah Allah that declares to Jibril that he loves so and so and then commands Jibril to love him and then Jibril declares to the angels in heaven that he loves so-and-so, and it commands them to love him. And then by extension is that people on the earth that <coughs> also come to love them because they love for the sake of Allah. So it's out of love, actually. Yeah. Hi, Nishan. Any questions on sister side? Totally. Mashallah. Yeah. Great question. Great question. So the question is about <coughs> following the sunnah of our Prophet Sallallahu is it how do we actually follow it? Do we follow every single detail? What does it really mean? And I think this is a very common question. Is it what does it mean to follow the sunnah of our Prophet Sallallahu And ultimately there's many dimensions to it. So there is a sunnah of the Prophet Sallallahu in relation to belief. In other words, is that the Prophet believed what the Quran taught him to believe. So how do we follow the sunnah? We believe as the Quran tells us to believe. Is that there's a sunnah in following the Prophet in terms of law, legal rulings, things you do and things you don't do. And so that the sunnah then is to that follow the Prophet in relation to those specific rules. You fulfill the commandments and you avoid the prohibitions. So we know our Prophet prayed five times a day. We know he fasted the month of Ramadan. We follow him in that. How did he used to do that in detail? We follow him in that. And then we follow the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi in relation to <coughs> character. What are the great traits of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam? And that trait by trait. He had mercy in his heart. We bring mercy into our heart. He was detached from the world. We bring that into our heart. He placed his trust in Allah. We place our trust in Allah. He loved Allah. We love Allah. He had compassion for it. We have compassion for it. He was tolerant and empathetic. We be tolerant and empathetic. And so forth and so on. He didn't have envy or arrogance or ostentation. And we follow him in that. Right? Um, so then it starts to get more and more fine-tuned. We follow the Prophet in terms of his dealings. What were the general principles and how he used to deal with people? We first know that by the rights that we're supposed to give people. So when we learn about the whole 
concept of rights, the rights of parents, the rights of teachers, the rights of neighbors, the rights of your fellow Muslims, the rights of other people in humanity. Every time that you fulfill someone's rights, you're following the Prophet at the base level, and then you know that beyond that, you're supposed to also have ihsan, and show excellence. So this is how it works, right? And then there's, for instance, what you call the sunnah of decision-making. How did our Prophet make decisions? There's a way, so all of these details that we learn, that open up the door for us to understand the comprehensive way in which we follow the Prophet ﷺ. But I think a lot of people get confused is because when they think of following the Prophet ﷺ, they only think of very outward things, like a beard and a hijab and clothing. And surely that's part of the sunnah of the Prophet Sallallahu and we have principles about those, but those are not the only things. And it's a mistake to say that they're not important, but it's also a mistake to say that they're the only thing that's important. But I think, so this is where we have to really expand uh, the horizons of our mind, what it means to follow the Prophet Sallallahu sunnah. And that's just, everything I mentioned is just touching the surface. And then there's a lot more details to, to follow. <coughs> And I think it's important to note there is that the Prophet's Sunnah is an objective reality that every single person of his Ummah can subjectively relate to, and that's the miracle of it. Is that there's a reality to the Sunnah of the Prophet. But then it's you can think of it like the sun. Is that the sun shines on everything, but there's different ways in which the sun shines on different things, if you will. But also the source of it all ultimately is the sun. And what we want is our portion of reflecting the light of our Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Okay, should we get into a little bit of the material inshallah? Okay, so just to set the... Uh, uh, so right now it's uh, 2.42. And um, what time is that prayer here? 4.45. Okay, so we want to... Uh, give people time to fresh up, so we'll try to stop by 4.30. So we're going to do a session um, until about uh, maybe 3.20, and then we'll pick back up and have one final session, inshallah ta'ala. Uh, or maybe we'll go to about 3.30, we'll see how it goes. And then have, so we have two more sessions, inshallah, with a break in between, time to prepare for Asr. Okay, so don't worry about session two here, just look at what we're talking about. Now we're going to move to, and again, the whole context here is about the Qur'an and the Prophet Wasallam. And what we hope to have introduced is the greatest way that we can come to know the Prophet Wasallam is through the Qur'an. And when we read the Qur'an carefully and we see how many times the Prophet is mentioned and how he's mentioned and what Allah says about him directly and indirectly, is that then we come from that with a that new conception of this is the way that it should be. And don't worry, at the end we're going to lay some broad strokes out of things that we can do moving forward uh, to strengthen our connection with him sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. So this session is on the qualities of our Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And again, this opens up a huge door. Look at what Allah says about him. So this is the, about the divine solicitude for the best of creation, for the Prophet Muhammad This verse in Surah Tur, وَاصْبِرْ لِحُكْمِ رَبِّكَ فَإِنَّكَ بِعْيُنِنَا And so this comes in Surah Tur. And we know that when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that says this, this actually in fact comes, um, this, is at the, this is the last, uh, the second to last verse in Surah Tatur. Surah Tatur has 49 verses. And then Surah Tanajim comes right after it, the chapter on the star. And the first verses in Surah Tanajim, some interpret them as the prophet that seen the Archangel Gabriel, but some say it can also validly be interpreted as a reference to the Prophet's night journey and ascension into the Divine Presence, into heaven, into, and ultimately to the Divine Presence. And so it's just really interesting to note here is that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is saying to the Prophet, Wasper, 
So be patient with your Lord's decree. لِحُكْمِ رَبِّكَ In other words, everything that you're going through, all of the persecution, the hate that you're experiencing, just imagine, how could you ever hate the Prophet? People, there was time, there was people who hated the Prophet. Like what an indication of the existence of Allah. Is that the fact that there are even atheists, the fact that there's even people that could hate the how could you ever hate the Prophet? And what did Allah say? In the Shani Aka, who al Abtar? Yani that your Mubrid, the one who hates you, who loathes you, he is the one who's cut off. When they said Batara Muhammad, is it when the Prophet's that male son, male child passed away? I say Batara Muhammad, and that's what it means is as that his lineage was cut off. And then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala revealed, And the broader meaning of them, then thinking that there's not good associated with the Prophet. And Allah says, Inna Inna, emphasizing, indeed, we have given you al kawthar Kawthar is ala sifa thaw'al, that it's a sifa mubalagha, it's to emphasize the meaning. We have given you abundant good. And literally, the Kawthar is a river in paradise that flows into the basin of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Thank you so much. And then it relates to all of the good that our Prophet has been given by Allah Ta'ala in all of its manifestations for him and his ummah here in this world and in the hereafter. So it has specific meanings and then it has broad meanings. And this is the multiple layers of interpretation of Allah's book. And then some of them say is that the Kawthar also specifically refers to the Ahl Bayt. Because the context of the verse, فَصَلِّ رَبِّكَ وَنْحَرْ So play to your Lord and that sacrifice in the shaniyaka. هُوَ الْأَبْتَارِ The one who loathes you, he is the one who's cut off. You're saying that his lineage is cut off. You are the one that's cut off from all good, and we've given him all good. Sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And this is why that, what is the dua that the Prophet made on the wedding night of Sayyidina Adi and the Sayyidina Fatima? Allahumma akhrij minhum al kathir al tayyib O Allah, bring forth many pure and good people from their loins. Is what we call them, Al Bayt Al Tahir, the purified household of the Prophet And in some places, is that when this verse is recited, is that people say Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam Ala Ala, is that they pray upon the, they send prayers upon the Prophet and his family, because one of the meanings that Kawthar refers to, in other words, is that we know by way of Hadith, as even though the Prophet had four daughters, is that his Dhuriya, his lineage by way of divine decree was through Sayyida Fatima. And that he that affirmed patrilineal lineage, but then he says that my lineage is special. It is through a Sayyida Fatima. And especially in particular, that through Sayyidina Ali and Sayyida Fatima, Sayyidina Ali had other children after the return of a Sayyida Fatima to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, but they're not considered to be Ahl Bayt, they're considered to be Ahl Bayt. The dominant opinion is, is that al bayt is broader than al bayt. Al al bayt are those who it's not permissible for them to receive zakah, and they're the believers from Bani Hashim, and that according to other scholars like the Shafi'iyah, that also Bani Muttalib, and that uh, that when the Prophet made this du'a, is that this is what we've seen for centuries, is that how many of the great awliya of the past have been from al bayt Rasulillah. And ultimately, anyone who has taqwa has the opportunity to be from the people of Allah. Like, and Allah a'lamu haythu yaj'alu risalatah. Allah knows best where to place His message. And there's something that the Ahl Bayt has that is very special in, in relation to their interpretation of the Quran in every single generation, but also in relation to their preservation of the Sunnah. And these are topics that are very important, but we're not going to go into too much detail in. So here Allah is commanding the Prophet, Be patient with your Lord's decree. Everything that you are going through with, going through, all of your difficulties, all of these calamities, know فَإِنَّكَ You are truly under our watchful eyes. 
Wow, that's really powerful. That is powerful. That what is Allah saying? Is that Allah is declaring that how beloved that His Prophet is to Him, subhanahu wa ta'ala. This is showing the divine solicitude, the divine care of Allah for the Prophet. And again, were you only to see the outward, there was times where it looked like the Prophet was being humiliated. There was times where he was prostrating, and people came and poured that feces from animals on him. As he's in a state of prostration. There was times where people are fighting him, insulting him, pushing him out of his seat, throwing rocks at him, spitting on him, pushing him. And if someone would see that, that a court, our hearts would be torn into pieces because it's the best of creation. And nafsi fida. We wish we could be ransomed for him. And like the Sahaba was about to be thrown into a that boiling that uh, a pot with boiling oil. And don't you wish that the Messenger of Allah was in your place? No. It says, I would that I wouldn't that trade this position for the Prophet to be poked by a thorn. Now, not only my life, I would choose this over the Prophet being poked by a thorn. This is the way they were. They understood their deen. And so, when you recognize that, then you recognize is that even when the Prophet outwardly seemed like he was being humiliated, the reality was his remembrance was raised with Allah. And if we maintain the principles of our deen, it will always lead to a good result. And we have this beautiful concept, which is Quranic, Ihdal Husnayn, that one of the two goods, either Mot ad Shahada, you die as a martyr, and this is in the context of battle, but it also relates to the battleground of life. Or is it you're given victory? Is it you come out on top? It's a win win situation for the believer. It's always a win-win situation if you and I stick to our principles. That is the key. And so outwardly, our Prophet went through a lot of difficulty. But the reality behind that is that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala was watching over him and granting him his divine solicitude in a way that he never shown to anyone before him or after him. Subhanahu wa ta'ala. And so how do we interpret all of those things? In other words, this is the nature of how people who are beloved to Allah live here in this world. In other words, is that the believer to the extent of our Iman, we will actually expect tribulations. What a different perspective. Nobody wants to bring difficulty upon themselves. But the mindset as a believer is that I'm going to go through tribulations. And like anything else, if you go into a situation where you're ready to face something, and you know that you're uh, about to have a, an, you get shot with a needle or something, you can brace yourself so it's less painful. But if it just happens out of the blue, it might be more painful because you weren't ready for it. If mentally that we approach life like, hmm, I could experience difficulties at any moment, and there might be serious difficulties. I just read recently that something I didn't know <coughs> that Imran ibn Hussein, the famous companion of the Prophet Sassim, who used to hear the taslim, the salam of the malaika, is that he was bedridden for 30, I think 33 years of his life before he met his Lord. Imagine being bedridden for 33 plus, 30 plus years. Wow. And imagine how horrible that would be. No one wants that. You don't make do offer. You ask Allah for afia. But when someone came to him and was showing so much empathy and felt sorry for him, is that he looked at that person and says, this is the decree of my Lord and this is what is most beloved to me. Because it's the decree of my Lord. We don't ask for it, but if Allah sends it your way, these are people of Iman. And they said that this is the decree of my Lord. What a meaning. Imagine if you and I had even something of that in our heart. And our perspective was is that we expect to be tried as long as we're here in this world. It will be very different than when we're tried. What we hope is is that we have a portion of this reality. And 
I asked Sheikh Samra this question. This is coming when we talk about the Kafir Khitab. Now, Allah speaking to the Prophet in the second person. And that he said it was a correct meaning. To the extent that we are close to the Prophet وسلم, is to the extent that we will have our portion of the Kafid Khitab, i.e., when Allah speaks to the Prophet وسلم, directly in the Quran in the second person. In other words, to the extent that we're close to the Prophet وسلم, is to the extent that it is as if Allah is also addressing us with that Kafid Khitab. And to the extent that we're distant from it is to from him is to the extent that we're distant from that reality. So in other words, is that the closer that we follow the Prophet, and the more this very verse also applies to us with the ups and downs of our own life. And the same command is also for us. Be patient with your Lord's decree. Endure. Have fortitude. If you live right and you follow my beloved, is that know that you're also under our watchful eyes. We're taking care of you. And these will be tribulations of those that are beloved to me. What a meaning. And what a beautiful perspective. And then, let's keep going. So if we move to the next slide. The Prophet Sallallahu is the greatest beloved. Some of them refer to him as Al Habib Al A'dham. He's the Habib Al A'dham. He's the greatest beloved of Allah Subhanahu wa Taala. And look in Surah Taha when Allah Subhanahu wa Taala says, "Wa'alqaytu alayka muhabbatan minni." I showered you with my love. And that here. That this relates, it's a khitab first and foremost to the Prophet Moses alayhi salam. But the context of Surah Taha, if you look from the beginning, Taha, which is one of the names of the best of creation, sallallahu alayhi salam. Ma anzanna alayka al-Qur'an al We did not reveal the Qur'an to you so that you would be miserable. And then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala goes on to recount the story of Moses. And in the story of Moses, that it goes on actually for quite a bit. And then <coughs> Allah Ta'ala eventually <coughs> gives us a summary of the life, excuse me, <coughs> of Sayyidina Musa. And how is that he inspired his mother to cast him into the river and that put him in the tabut. And then he was that it cast him upon the shore, and then that his enemy, the enemy of Allah, the Pharaoh, is that then took him. But what does Allah Ta'ala say? Look at the, the context of this verse, it's really ajib. And anikli fihi tabut, they put him in the tabut, the box of the chest. Fakdi fihi filyam, cast him in the river. And he was cast from the river onto the shore. Ya'khuthu aduwan li wa aduwan la. An enemy of mine and an enemy of his will take him. minni. Look at the context of the story. Right? This is when Bini Israel is being persecuted. The men are being killed and the women are being spared. And Moses is that miraculously taken in by the Pharaoh himself. And the whole reason they're killing the men is because they were aware that there would be someone from Bini Israel that would lead to his demise just to show the power of Allah Jalla Jalala. And that meaning extends to us to the same day. There will be people that grow up in the belly of the beast, in countries like the one in which we live, and in other places in the world. And despite all of the fitna, everything that's out there that could lead them astray and cause them to disbelieve or to live a terrible life, is that Allah will shelter some of them and protect them and grant them guidance and help them be firm upon the path and maintain istiqamah and be upright before him. Whether they were born into Islam or whether they converted at a certain point. And so in the context of this, look at this. An enemy of mine and an enemy of his that takes him. minni. And then amidst all of that, I have showered you with my love, O Moses. Despite outwardly how this is looking, 
It's a dismal situation. How is this even going to work? And Allah is saying to him that I have cast my love. I've showered my love upon you, O Moses. وَلِتُسْنَ ala aini, So that you will be brought up under my watchful eye. Allah, this is so powerful. There are people that are grown, grow up in the United States of America. And again, either into a Muslim family they are born or accept this religion. And they are raised under the watchful eye of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala despite the difficulties of their time. And they have a nasib, they have their portion of this. Where the Lord of the heavens and the earth is saying, وَأَلْقَيْتُ عَلَيْكَ مَحَبَّةً مِنِي Allah is saying that I've showered you with my love. What is that? What does that mean? What is Moses' experience? And so, this ultimately is teslia for the Prophet Allah is bringing solace to the Prophet just as your brother in prophethood Moses also was persecuted and went through unimaginable difficulties, so you do too. But know in the midst of all of that, in reality it's because I love you. And if that's in relation to Sayyidina Moses, the greatest beloved is the best of creation, sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi wa And then, keep reading in Surah Taha, Allahu Akbar. What does he say next? The Prophet is the Chosen One. So that comes in verse 39 of Surah Taha. And then we learn about that his sister and how he, she uh, suggested that she knew someone that could take care of Moses because he wasn't nursing. And that he was eventually returned to his mother. And so that she would be pleased and she would not grieve. And then Moses mistakenly kills the Qipti. And then Allah Ta'ala that saved him from that distress. وَفَتَنَّاكَ فُتُونَ We tried you in all different ways. Look at that. وَفَتَنَّاكَ فُتُونَ Allah ascribes this to himself. And referring to Sayyidina Musa, we've just tried you in all different types of ways. That here the Fatuna is emphasis. وَفَتَنَّاكَ فُتُونَ All of these different tribulations. But again, What's the, con what's the context of them? You lived for many years amongst the people of Midian. Then you came to the appointed time, O Moses. And what does Allah say? This is one of the most amazing things of all. The Lord of the heavens and the earth is saying, I have chosen you for myself. Allah Jalla Jal is saying, I have chosen you, O Moses, for myself. What kind of individual is that? The Lord of the heavens and the earth is saying, Was Tanatuka, I have chosen you. I've literally created you for me. SubhanAllah. What do you think Allah is going to give a certain of his like that? And if that's as great as it is with Moses, then what about with Rasulullah? What about the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam? That meaning moves your heart. And this is that side of things that we we're referring to. We said there's an outward and there's an inward dimension. Is that there's a Sharia dimension and a Hakika dimension? This is that Hakika dimension. And this meaning from the bounty of Allah extends to the entire Ummah throughout the centuries. And everything that the Ummah has gone through, the Ummah has gone through severe tribulations. Severe tribulations throughout the centuries. And every time people think that, khalas, we're going to put out the light of Islam, it never happens. And it never will happen. This affair belongs to Allah. And just when people think that they have power and control is usually when its carpet is pulled from beneath their feet. And Allah Ta'ala will allow certain things to happen in order to try us. But then it reaches a certain point where khalas. Is that 
justice happens, or people are taking the task, or they're punished here in this world, or that the tide turns. This is the nature. But do you see the importance of understanding this? Is that this gives us a perspective when we understand world events and current events, how it is that you and I need to be. And it doesn't mean that we don't do anything. But it has to be a sacred activism that is rooted in the principles of our deen that begins with our own selves and then extends to doing anything and everything that we can within the realm of what is permissible. And with the added dimension, the nuance is that not everybody has to do the same thing. Everybody has to play their role and to use their divine God-given gifts to do what it is that they can do. And then collectively, if we all are doing what it is that we're doing, while we rectify ourselves, we know for sure Allah will change our condition. And this is the truth. This is the way that the ulama have always understood it. And this is why that their approach has never changed over the past 1400 years. The principles are the same, despite everything that happens. So to further this meaning, so again, we're talking now about these special qualities of the Prophet I'm learning how beloved the Prophet is to Allah, as we see in the Book of Allah, not even moving to the Hadith or not even moving to anything else. This is the best way to do this. Look at this verse in Surah Al-Baqarah. Allah Ta'ala says, قَدْ نَرَى تُقَلَّبَ وَجْهِكَ فِي السَّمَاءِ فَلَا نَوَلِيَنَّكَ قِبْلَةً تَرْضَاهَا is that indeed we see as an extra eye there. O Prophet, turning your face towards heaven, now we will make you turn towards a direction of prayer that will please you. So again, Allah is saying that he saw the Prophet ﷺ that turning towards heaven. And that the Prophet ﷺ wanted the Qibla to be changed to Medina, to Mecca and Mukarramah. The initial Qibla was of course towards the Quds, towards Jerusalem. And <clears throat> Allah Ta'ala then says, we will make you turn towards a direction of prayer that will please you. And one of the things that Sayyidah Aisha noticed about the Prophet Sallallahu in his relationship with Allah, she said this beautiful statement, Indeed, your Lord hastens to make you pleased, to give you what you want. She notices. And of course, the way we view this is, Allah only put in the heart of the Prophet ﷺ what it is that he wanted to give him. So when the Prophet ﷺ wanted something, it was only what Allah wanted because Allah would only put in his Prophet's heart what he wanted to give him. So when the Prophet wanted something, he was given it. خلاص. That's amazing. And here it says, is that we are going to give you a qibla. Allah could have just said, he, we're going to give you a direction of prayer, but tardaha, that you are pleased with. Allah is saying this about the Prophet. So, this is one that we all know, that we've heard. But really, no matter how many times that you look at this, is that it never ceases to amaze you. It's so amazing. Say, O oh, Prophet, and this is a whole other dimension. How many times in the Quran does Allah say, Qul? And this is coming, we'll talk about this in the next session. How many times does Allah say, Qul? And what he's doing is, he's telling the Prophet ﷺ to say, Say, O oh, Prophet. And so Allah is commanding the Prophet then to say this, and then we learn what it is that can then conveyed. In kuntum tuhibbun Allah. Say that if you love Allah, for those that claim that they love Allah. So there's a lot of people out there that claim religion, claim that they are good people, claim that they love Allah, claim that they want to draw near to God. But Allah is saying, if, say, O Prophet, if you love Allah, then the sign that you love Allah is fattabiyuni. Follow me. Do what I do, say what I say, 
act as I act, be as I am. And then, yuhbibkumullah. What is more precious and more valuable and greater and more magnificent and splendid and illustrious and just keep going on and on and on then becoming beloved to Allah. What is greater than that? There's nothing greater than that in existence than to become beloved to Allah. The only thing that comes after that is to receive the divine contentment. And so Imam al azadi says something beautiful. He says that the only station after the station of love is the station of contentment. And the reason that the righteous ask for the station of commitment because they realize is that the secret to the perpetual gaze upon the noble countenance of Allah eternally was the divine contentment after having become beloved to Allah. That is the richest and greatest meaning in existence. Nothing is greater than that. If anything motivates us, it should be that which motivates us. If anything moves us, it should be that which moves us. That is why we live. And if someone attains that by having a bomb dropped upon them and die suddenly without realizing it, they've attained the greatest thing that you can possibly attain. If someone attains that by living a long life into their 90s, then they've attained the greatest thing. However it is that someone attains that, we ask Allah for lutul af, we don't ask, I'm speaking now from the standpoint of haqiqa, don't misquote me. But the point is, if you attain that, you have attained everything. Nothing is more precious than that meaning. And I would like to ask, maybe not so much in the MCC community, because you have great khatibs that speak here in Juma. But a lot of people have never heard this meaning in their entire life. It's amazing. How could you never have heard this in your life? You all have good people here in this community. Sheikh Hamza, Imam Zaid, and on and on and on and on and on. All the blessed teachers of Zaytun, all the blessed teachers in this community, of Qadi Umbar, all these blessed people. These are meanings you all are used to here, hearing. But there are people quite literally who've never heard that in their life. The best thing that you can possibly achieve and attain, there's people who've never heard that meaning. What a tragedy, a travesty rather. That is unbelievable. We should talk about this day in and day out. This should motivate us to do everything that it is that we do. And it is because is that the love of Allah directly equates to us experiencing the sweetness of faith. This is when faith becomes sweet. This is when you love to make dhikr. This is when your shahwa for dhikr is stronger for your shahwa than even the greatest shahwat and desires that exist in this world. And this is what we, how we want to be. And that, as that one of them said in poetry film, the ma lahum shahwa illa li dhikrillah. There's people that are out there that their shahwa is dhikrullah, to remember Allah. That becomes their shahwa what they like to do, what they enjoy. You put them alone in a dark room that's tight and constricted and with no one else around, no one to bother them, and they're as happy as could possibly be. And their heart expands and they're just remembering their Lord. And the sweetness that they've brought to their heart is greater than any desire that anyone could ever experience in this world any drug that can possibly alter your mind or produce any type of euphoric feeling, what these people experience is greater than all of that. There's no comparison. And it's halal. It's permissible. And that it's intoxicating spiritually. And this happens when you tap into these meanings. And the door to that is Rasulullah. He's the door and his inheritors, and these traditions that we have of chains of transmission back to him. When you connect them, these are the same meaning. This is what they do. This is what they want from their students. They want their students to become beloved to Allah. And then think about how this person then is fulfilling their duty here on earth. Their heart is with Allah. Their, their shahwa, their desire is Allah. 
and remembrance of Allah. And their desire ultimately is to meet Allah. And they don't even really want to remain here in this world other than to, to get more good deeds to prepare themselves for the meeting with Allah. Now imagine a person who's like that, and then they're serving in the world for some cause that needs to be served. What do you think their impact is going to be? Precisely because they're so detached, they're going to be that disproportionately effective to the degree that they're detached. The more detached, the more effective and beneficial that they're going to be. And these are the meanings that we need. These are the meanings that make us whole. So now let's look at a series of verses here that also point to many of these special qualities of Rasulullah sallallahu And so, the Rida, which is what? The contentment. I didn't translate that because it wouldn't have fit on the title. It's a long title. Is the Rida of Allah. This is Quran. In other words, when the Prophet was content with something, it was an indicator that the Lord of the heavens and the earth was con is content. Think about the meet that meaning. Really, these are very. This is really profound. So Allah says, "Yahlifun bilahilakum liyurdukum." They swear by Allah to you believers in order to please you. Okay, the munafiqun, the hypocrites. Wallahu wa rasuluhu ahakku in yurduhu in kana mu'minin. Well, it is the pleasure of Allah and His Messenger they should true they, if uh, they should seek if they are true believers. It doesn't come across in translation. But if you look very carefully at the Arabic, Wallahu wa rasuluhu, that's dual in Arabic. Because you have Allah and His Messenger. But then Allah says, Ahakku, have more right, and Yurduhu. So, Radiya Yarda is to be content. Arda Yurdi is to make content. Okay, so if I say, Yani, Ardaituhu, I made him content. So here, Allah is saying, is that Allah and His Messenger, which again, that's the dual, have more right for you to please him, literally, yurdu hu. It, Allah didn't say, en yurdu huma, en yurdu hu. So the wisdom that some of the ulama point out, everything is perfectly placed in the Quran. The fact, en yurdu hu, even though it's a mention of Allah and his messenger, indicates ittihad al-rida. The rida of the Prophet is the rida of Allah. That is the meaning taken directly from the Book of Allah. In kanu mu'minin. Indeed, they are true believers. What a meaning. And the companions understood this, is that when they made the Prophet happy, they realized is that it, was leading, it would lead to the contentment of Allah. And think about the story of Abu Mus Musa al-Ash'ari, when he was leading the prayer, <coughs> when he was praying, rather, and the Prophet walked by at night, Sayyidina Abu Bakr and Sayyidina Omar, and he heard him reciting. And then Sayyidina Abu Bakr beat it, Omar to it, and he told Abu Musa al-Ashari, the great glad tidings of what the Prophet had said. The Prophet loved his recitation of Abu Musa. And he says, لَقَدْ أُوْتِيَ مِزْمَارَ مِنْ مَزَامِرْ أَلِ Dawood. He's been given a flute from the flutes of the house of David, indicating the beauty. And just imagine the the hymns that David السلام, used to recite. There was a sister, she's a convert sister, this is a really Mubarak sister. Uh, she actually saw the Prophet says in a dream before she became Muslim. And then eventually became Muslim. And that one of her intentions is, is that to live in a way such that on Yom Al she can hear Dawood السلام, recite his hymns in an incredible, beautiful way. What a Munawar intention. What an enlightened intention. And when your heart is attached to things like these, these are the type of things that Allah gives you when your heart is attached to them. This is why we want our heart to be Urwi. We want our heart to be Samawi. We want our heart to be celestial. We want our hearts to be heavenly. We want our hearts to be attached to high things. And your heart gets attached to high things by speaking about them.
by reading about the stories of the righteous who are gifted these great things. And when you read about them, you start to attain matalib in things that you can seek that you didn't even know was present. So another example of that is, is that one of our shuk said, is that there will be people who are so close to the Prophet ﷺ on the Day of Judgment, is that when he's inspired with those Muhammad, those words of praise that he said in this world, he did not know right now, but he'll be inspired with them, and whereby which he will be differentiated from all of creation, even Abraham, let alone everyone after him, will realize who the Prophet is and why he was preferred over them. He said there'll be some people who will be so close to the Prophet ﷺ, is that they'll hear those words of praise with their own ears. There will be people who that have the seerah of the Prophet recounted to them, the Prophet's life story, by the Prophet himself. This is not found in a verse or found in a hadith of the Prophet that these are meanings that come to the people of Nur and Basira. They're not wajib beliefs. You don't have to believe this 100%, but I wouldn't deny it either. These are coming from trustworthy sources. And these are lataif. That learning things like that, that's something that's possible. Then you long for it. You long for it. And when you start longing for these meanings, that's a very good sign. That your heart is different. And these meanings have to be cultivated in environments of faith and iman and nur. And once the heart is saturated, this is what happens. You become Samawi. Your heart, and this is what, how we're supposed to be. And the, what Sayyidina Adi said to that Kumail, his blessed companion, and that when he asked him about the true ulama al-aminin, and he went, started by saying, that whom al qawm hajama bihim al ilm ala haqiqat al amr. There are people that true knowledge has rushed them to experiencing the reality of the affair, the true nature of reality. Fabashru ruh al yaqeen. So they experience the spirit of utmost certitude. And then he goes on to describe them. That they are people that, what were their hearts like? Sahib al-dunya bi-abdanihim. They lived in the world with their physical bodies. Wa qulubuhum mu'allakatun bil malal But their hearts are attached to the supreme assembly, the celestial realm. Outwardly they're in the dunya, they're with people, but their hearts are different. This is what we're being called to, where we only to realize. This is our deen. And once you realize that, reality exists, and it becomes part of your reality, all of the affairs of this world are easy for you to process, no matter what happens, if someone has that. But if we're bereft of that, and we think that the only thing here is this world, to the degree that we think that is to the degree that we'll suffer. If this is all that we have, you don't want to lose it. But when you realize that actually, this is what it's about. And the also is, is that everything we do is for the hereafter. It's one of the most oft-quoted verses. How many times your parents might even have told you this? Don't forget your portion of this world. And certainly that we're not telling people to not have their worldly affairs intact. No, have your worldly affairs intact. Get an education, have a career, get your stuff together, do what you got to do, right? But, <clears throat> no, that's only part of the story, and you have to do that ultimately for the sake of Allah. But quote the verse from the beginning. <laughs> Seek through what Allah has given you the abode of the hereafter. That's the asl, that's the foundation. Is that It's actually the opposite meaning to the way that people quote it. Al with what Allah has given you, seek the hereafter. Use everything that you've give, been given for the abode of the hereafter, for the hereafter. Don't forget your portion of the world. So now people use it opposite. Is that we all know that the vast majority of us is we're steeped in dunya. What we need is a little bit more akhirah.
and you start talking a little bit more accurate, people start getting really worried, like, oh my God, please, I don't want them to leave school. But and, and then parents are between a rock and a hard spot. They don't want their kids sometimes to be too religious, but they don't want them to be irreligious. They don't want them to practice too much, but then they get worried when they start going off the deep end. It's like, what's wrong with you? Right? Just practice religion correctly from the right people and have your dunya together. That we should, that that know the true meanings of womanhood and manhood and what it means to be responsible and what it means to work. If you're working hard for the sake of Allah Ta'ala to provide for your family, you are fi sabilillah and you're getting the reward for an obligation in doing so. And if you die working, you die and get the reward of a shaheed, you're fi sabilillah when you're working to support your family. And that Especially in Malam, make everything easy for you all here in the Bay Area. La hawla wa rakwata la bila. Pennsylvania is a lot cheaper, I'll tell you that. And people have to work hard here just to put food on the table, subhanAllah. And that we have to appreciate the hard work that people do. Even if they have to work long hours, we don't have the luxury of just closing up shop like people did in previous times where they own their own store or something and just, okay, I've had enough, I'm going home for the day that uh, we live in a very valuable time, and that has to be respected, the amount of time. And we can't make people feel guilty, you don't spend enough time with me, or you don't spend enough time with the kids, and things like that. Yani, is that if someone is consciously doing that because they don't want to spend time with the kids, that's something else. But if they're doing that to make ends meet, and to provide a good living in a household, and put food on the table, that has to be supported and appreciated. And people shouldn't be guilt tripped for it. Anyhow, we want to have hearts, ultimately, even though we're Sahib al dunya are outwardly where it look, exists in the world, but our hearts are attached to the Mal al ala And these are why we sing beautiful poems. Because for those moments, is that when we recite those poems, it's a time for us to, Ya Allah, to remember what's truly important. And they say the secret of Nasheed is that the natural uh, procl the, pro the proclivity within the human being to love beautiful sounds and to love beautiful sights comes from the divine address when he that spoke to us in the pre-earthly realm and said, Alas to be Rabbi, come not your Lord. And so naturally we incline towards beautiful sounds. And especially that when we hear beautiful poetry, poetry was recited during the time of the Prophet and when you add to it a beautiful lehen, a beautiful melody, it doesn't change the biblical ruling, as long as the words are good, and those means then uplift us. Where then we remind ourselves, mm. and the beautiful thing is in traditional societies, they've woven this into the fabric of their society. So you see this at lunches, you see this at gatherings, you see this even at weddings, you see this at, at all different types of social functions where there's constant reminders of what it is that our hearts should be inclining towards. And unfortunately that we still just live this very dry reality of Islam and that it might suffice for salvation but to reach the higher stations that we need to think about things in a different way. So, when Sayyidina Abu Bakr Siddiq told Abu Musa al-Ashari that the Prophet had praised his recitation, he came to the Prophet and said, Ya Rasulullah, were I to have known that you were listening, that I would have embellished my recitation in the very best of ways. Astaghfirullah. That's a riyah. It's ostentation. Astaghfirullah. That's a riyah. To tell someone that you would have recited better for them if they were listening, that's a riyah. That's ostentation in a normal circumstance. But not with the Prophet. Because he knew that if the Prophet was content with him, that meant Allah was content with him. He understood this meaning. He was a master of Quran. He understood. So they wanted to please the Prophet because they knew if they pleased him, they're pleasing Allah. And the Prophet didn't say, Astaghfirullah. Don't please me, only please Allah. Right? That's not what he said. That the Prophet did, did not that rebuke him. And it would have been wajib for him to correct his understanding if it was wrong. Sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi wa So this is how they were. They knew the value of the prophetic contentment. And for us, we don't get to see the Prophet but if we live in a way that's pleasing to him, 
you will have confirmations in the dream world from the Prophet himself, وسلم, indicating to you that you're on the right path, that you're doing the right thing. And we should all long for that. The way that the companions long to receive the approval from the Prophet during their lifetime, this door is open until Yawm Qiyamah for his Ummah to see him in a dream and to have an experience with him Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam It is now 3.30 Okay We'll wrap this up inshallah ta'ala next session then move to the next part Bi'ithnillahi ta'ala What does that say? The blessing of Allah We'll stop here Wa sallallahu ala sayyidi muhammad wa ala alihi wa sallam wa sallam wa alhamdulillahi rabbil alameen So let's take about a 10 minute break until uh, 3.40 and then we'll come back and do one final session, inshallah ta'ala. Uh, please keep your questions and uh, we can uh, entertain them in the beginning of the uh, next session, be in the night time. Okay, we have a little bit more work to do. Uh, this won't be in a full, full session. Uh, are there any other brief questions that anyone has on anything that we've taken or anything uh, unrelated? Anything else that is uh, on your mind? Well, the we can just pass the mic and the request was from them to speak right into it so the people on the live stream can hear you. Oh, this may not. Is it uh, on there? Uh, I, come sit on, uh, I was wondering, is it uh, beneficial to learn about the other topics? Hmm. Or, or is it uh, enough to learn and love uh, the prophets? Uh, <laughs> Yeah, absolutely. So the question is: Is that uh, is it good to learn about the other prophets other than the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, or is it sufficient to learn about uh, the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam? So, from the standpoint of aqidah, from the standpoint of creed and belief, we're actually required to believe in twenty-five prophets, all of whom are mentioned in the Quran. So in general, we believe that there was, there's a hadith that says there was 124,000 prophets. And because of the level of that hadith, the scholars say, Allahu Adam, there might have been more. So we say we believe there are 124,000 plus prophets. And then there's, we say that we believe that 313 of them, but again, we don't say definitively because of the nature of how that hadith has been established. There's been 313 prophets, uh, me uh, excuse me, messengers that have been given books. Um, 25 of whom were required to believe in detail, by name, and they're mentioned in the Qur'an. So from that standpoint, it's an obligation to learn the names of the other prophets. And in general, is that the greatest prophet that we can learn about is the Prophet Muhammad But it's also good to learn about the other prophets and to that read the various stories in the Qur'an about the other prophets. And the Qur'an also encourages us to learn about other special people from the past. You have like the Ashab al-Kahf, the companions of the cave, or the sleepers of the cave. You have the whole chapter on that Mary. And she was not a prophetess, she was a Siddiqa. She was a great saint. And that someone who reached the highest degrees of closeness to Allah. And that we also have other stories of other pious people that we learn about in the last book, indicating to us in general the importance of loving the people of Allah. So it's a good thing to learn about all of the people that Allah has blessed, but the most time we should spend is on the Prophet Muhammad. But it's also good to learn about the others. And we know quite a bit about the Prophet Jesus, we know quite a bit about the Prophet Moses and uh, some of the other prophets. Uh, and um, that it's it's good to learn about them, but ultimately, one of the fruits of that learning about them is also is that we also recognize the great distinction of our own prophet in relation to them, because he's the imam of all of them. So, yeah. brother, mm -hmm. it's coming to you the microphone. I work in a prison, and. I would appreciate any advice you could give me for the Muslims in the prison. We have a great example in Malik al Haj Shabazz, Malcolm. Oh, and I always remind them of that. But any uh, advice you could give to help the brothers that are in prison would be appreciated. Beautiful. I'm going to ask my brother Oscar to comment two minutes on that, and then I'm going to jump in. So hand that to Okay. I'm, I want to hear what he has to say, and I'm going to jump in after. Inshallah. Bismillah. Um, 
so what I would just say, and again, that you know better because you're in that environment, right? And uh, I've never been a chaplain. That when I've been in with fellow chaplains, my visits have been very brief. And the one thing that I'll say is that the brothers that I've seen that are in prison, that are adhering to Islam, is that they're probably some of the closest people that I've seen that remind me of the Sahaba and the companions of the Messenger of Allah. And it's amazing. Right? And I'm like, are you giving dawah to me or I'm giving dawah to you? Right? You know, because the way they affect you, because how they have to be about it in their situation. Um, but I really think genuinely, if the it could be cultivated into the heart the importance of learning and studying the religion and appreciating that, I think this is one of the greatest things that can happen. And that the stories that I hear from like our brother Sheikh Rami and Sur and everything he's doing through Tayba and that how transformative it is is that when you have people that really embrace this tradition so there's a knowledge component. And that I think that if that could really be cultivated where people start taking knowledge seriously and then if it's possible that and obviously there's limits in that situation, how polarized it is and how everyone has to stay with their own particular group and be very careful about who they bring in from other groups, but to not forget the dawah imperative to the extent possible, where there is an active calling of people to the truth of Islam. And I think those two things are in general, uh, though I would encourage anyone, but especially our brothers <clears throat> that are in that situation, is to that cultivate in the meanings of wanting to learn and then pride, provide for them resources to go in depth in their deen and remind them of the importance of even being in that situation of that the importance of dawah. And the example there is one of Sayyidina Yusuf who gave dawah even while he was locked up, even while he was in prison. It didn't prevent him from that calling to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And then within that process of learning, all of the meanings that are there to help someone, given the incredible difficulty of being in that situation, to get by and to never lose hope and to then cultivate the heart so that it's oriented towards the afterlife. Is it to the extent that that happens is to the extent that Allah will give them a resilience where in which they'll be able to that overcome that situation they're in to prepare for the hereafter. That's not easy to do. It's very easy to speak about, much more difficult to actually practically implement. But just with the limited knowledge I have and experience, that's what, what comes to my mind. Beautiful. May Allah give you tawfiq and, and, and bless you in all of your affairs. And what I hope is that our community uh, reaches a level of maturity where is that all of these dividing lines that naturally exist by virtue of this polarized society in which we live is that we don't uphold those same stereotypes and same dividing lines. Muslims should be able to get beyond all of that. And that we need to recognize that we are collectively an ummah, a body, and that we should that be concerned about everyone in a very real way and resist the urge to remain comfortable in our own silos. And that I'm hoping that we can do much better than, than we've been doing. There is some promising work, but we have a long, long, long way to go. And where people only to realize that how much benefit can that, if I speak in a specific sense, come from our brothers that are giving da'wah that in prison and the needs that when they get out, this is some of the most important work of all that we absolutely have to support. So may Allah give you tawfiq and, and give you strength. And I'm hoping that, that the community realizes the importance of these types of initiatives and get behind you and support you and support the brothers and uh, to can provide other opportunities for other people when they get out, but also prevent people from going in in a very real way. In a very real way. Unfortunately, many of the most important initiatives are the least funded and the ones that people care about the least. And uh, where people only to realize uh, the doubt were opportunities that lie even for those that are still inside. But we don't tend to direct resources towards that. And that were we only to realize the opportunity there, we would direct a significant amount of resources from our community, you know, and that actively train people. We should have a nationwide program where we want 10,000 new chaplains in the next 20 years. 
that are going to be placed in every that that prison uh, that we can that you can actually have people in nationwide, and um, that supporting materials and uh, different ways of uh, teaching niches and things of that nature, we have to take this seriously, and hopefully things will get better in Shamla. Let's see. Now we'll go over here too. Mustafa was your name, right? Told to have you. In Arabic or in English? You you cite Arabic, right? You read Arabic? Yes, I do. Allahumma salli wa sallam ala wa ala ala. So, um, in English, um. It, it's hard to beat Martin Ling's Sirah in English. It's a really, really good Sirah. It's really hard to beat that. Um, now there's probably about 10 to 15 other abridged books that are now out. There's a lot of good translations of Sirah uh, in English nowadays. And they all tend to be a little bit more abridged. I say Martin Ling's because uh, it goes into a little bit more depth. And it's very, uh, it's very well written. Um, but uh, I'm going mind blank right now. Give me a second here. I know this one I'm missing. Dr. Ali, remind me. What would you recommend? Or see books in English. Thank you, Sultan, Sultan of, of the Hearts. Very good book. Thank you. You just sparked my mind. So I would start with like a Martin. Actually, I would start with even more bridge one, right? Move to Martin Ling's, okay, and then go to the Sultan of the Hearts, and then go to the two volume. This is one of the larger books of the Samira Zaid. Is it in English? The Prophetic Narrative. The the Prophetic Narrative. And that's two thick volumes. So now you have your work cut out for you for the next like year or two. So I would move from Martin Ling Sierra to uh, Sultan of the Hearts, which is very good. I think it's Rashid Haylemes. Uh, Haylemes. And then um, the, the Prophetic Narrative, which is written by Samir Zaid, uh, and then translated by N.C. Tamara Gray and a couple others, I think. So those are the ones that are um, in in English, or in Arabic. I mean, ya Allah, there's a the Mawahib al Dunya by Muhammad Qustalani is just mind blowing, as well as its abridgment uh, Al Anwar al Muhammadiyah by Sheikh Yusuf al Nabahani. Um, those would be two of the ones that I would recommend in Arabic. Uh, al uh, Anwar al Muhammadiyah. Sheikh Yusuf and Nabahani, and then Al uh, Mawahib al Dunya by Imam al Qustalani, and then um, another book that everybody should read is a Shifa by Qadi Iyad. And there's a new abridgment of the Shifa, I think by his name is um, Amjad Sheikh Ahmed Mahmoud. Uh, that you want to start with the abridgment. It has a white cover. I think it was published recently, and then get to the Original. Yes. Yep. That's another book. Yeah. Yeah. Any other questions on the sister side? All right. So let's finish up here and show. So we left off on this side. I'm going to move through these other ones fairly quickly. That it just goes on and on and on. These are selections. Again, this is all under the uh, title of this. Part of the special qualities of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi They just go on and on. And so this is taught. The Prophet is the blessing of Allah. And otherwise, like, the blessing. Like, with alif lam ta'rif, an ni'mah. And Imam al-Busiri says in his very famous poem, the Burda Sharifa, وَمَنْ هُوَ النِّعْمَ الْآيَةُ الْكُبْرَى لِمُعْتَبِرٍ he says, the Prophet is the greatest sign for those who reflect. Of all the signs in creation, the greatest sign is the Prophet. And he is the greatest blessing for those who want to benefit. So, 
in this verse in Surah Al Imran, وَذْكُرْ نِعْمَةُ اللَّهِ عَلَيْكُمْ إِذْ كُنْتُمْ أَعْدَاءً Remember Allah's favor upon you when you were enemies. فَأَلَّفَ بَيْنَ قُلُوبِكُمْ Then He united your hearts. فَأَصْبَحْتُمْ بِنِعْمَةِ إِخْوَانًا So you, by His grace, became brothers. That's the outward way you translate it. But who is the ni'ma here referring to? The Prophet. Being ni'mati through our Prophet. One of his names is Ni'matullah. It's one of the names of the Prophet. And so, uh, the Prophet is the blessing of Allah. He's the greatest blessing of Allah of all. Of all blessings in creation, he's the greatest blessing of all. There's no blessing greater than the Prophet And he is the source of all of our worldly and otherworldly, all blessings in this world and all blessings in the hereafter, he's the source of all blessings. Not just religious blessings. That's clear. We would not have anything of our religion were not to be for our Prophet. But those that truly understand how beloved the Prophet is to Allah, if we go back to that hadith that we started with, is that it goes on. Is that where Allah then spoke to Adam after forgiving him and said, were it not to be for him, lo la hu, were it not to be for the Prophet, I would have not created heaven or earth, I would not create the fire or paradise, and I wouldn't have created you. And so who is the Prophet? And so essentially, all of us and all people in creation, including the other Prophets, including the members of their Ummah, and all other people, and everything else that in this world is considered to be a blessing, is able to experience those blessings because of the blessing. So from the blessing of the Prophet we get to experience all blessings. That's pretty amazing. Who is Rasulullah And this knowledge is that once you condition your heart to think about this, this is what it means to have a heart that is Samawi. Is that you start to love talking about these meanings. And you find great value in these meanings because you understand what gems they truly are. And when the heart becomes habituated to tasting the sweetness of these meanings, and you that condition it such that it is heavenly and inclines towards that what is truly great with Allah, you start to realize is that this is the source of blessing, it is a source of light, it is a source of inspiration, it is a source of tranquility, it is a source of serenity, and keep going on and on and on. It's the source of wilaya, sainthood, it's the source of all good that can come to you when you condition your heart to this. And then you always will have people, and this is why the Arab always spoke about, there was what's called ghazal, it's love poetry, and that Many of the same themes that those who speak about the Prophet and write love poetry about him are the same themes that the Jahadi poets spoke about when they were speaking about the opposite gender. And they always will speak about the wusha. The wusha are the detractors. Right? The la'im. Imam Abu Sayyid, Ya la'imi fil hawal udri ma'adiratan. Oh, you are that criticizing me. And this vestal love that I have, this pure love, that I seek an excuse from you, that from me to you, is it were you to be fair, you wouldn't criticize me, you wouldn't rebuke me. Were you to know my state, would you know what happens to the heart of someone that falls in love with the best of creation, we only to know is that you would never rebuke me. And you see this throughout the poetry, is that they always talk about people that rebuke them. There'll be people here that's like, let's talk about something else. This is boring. I know this. Let's move on. I'd rather talk about current events. Let's go here. Let's talk about that. There's a lot of other things, of course, we can talk about. But if we really understand this discourse and the heart is conditioned towards it, it's very different then. Because the true people of Allah, the greatest awliya, you will always see they bring everything back to the Prophet Because they realize every spiritual gift 
even in relation to what they experience in the Divine Presence from spiritual states, is all from Rasulullah. So how could they do anything else other than bring it back to the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam? That's how they are. That's how the greats are. They always bring it back to him. Always bring it back to him. Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And we're beginners. We don't know what we're doing. That we're blind, deaf, dumb, and stupid. But we're trying to do a little what we can. And to move in the right direction and just follow those that we know are that the true lovers and the true people of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Do the little that we can. So the next slide. What does that one say? Obeying the Prophet is obeying Allah. Man Allah. Am I going the wrong way? Alright, tell me when I'm there. We're good? Obeying the Prophet is obeying Allah. Very clear. Whoever obeys the Messenger has obeyed Allah. Which other human being can you say that about? Very straightforward. Does that say pledging allegiance? No? This is switching up on me here. It's like I'm doing the opposite thing here. Pledging allegiance to the Prophet is pledging allegiance to Allah. Sorry, there's a typo there. Inna ladin yubayyu'unaka. Surely those who pledge allegiance to you outwardly, their hand was in the hand of the Prophet. So I said him, Inna ma Allah. Are actually pledging allegiance to Allah. Very clear meaning. And then, I should say session three. Okay, so let's look at in this last session that several instances of where that Allah Jalla Jalalu uses what is called the kafir khitab. That is, that He speaks to the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam in the second person. So these are a few early examples, then we're going to move towards that juz Amma. Say, O Prophet, whoever is an enemy of Gabriel should know that he revealed this Qur'an to your heart by Allah's will. So think about this. So when we said that statement, like there were people who show, and it's part of the, shows the veracity and truthfulness of our Prophet, that Moses is mentioned more in the Qur'an than our Prophet is in terms of his name. But And while that is true, and that's important, that does indicate something. No one is going to write a book and then have someone else mention more than your own self in that book, right? Because he wasn't the one who wrote it. It's revelation that he received. But it's greater to have Allah speak to you directly in his book. Allah says. He's speaking directly to the Prophet. And then by extension, that we're supposed to know this meaning as his ummah. He revealed it to your heart. We surely have sent you with truth, O Prophet. So I want you to pay attention when you read translations of the Quran and see when we see this, O Prophet. Look at you, the Kafir Khitab. What is being meant there? What is being referred to there? This is very important. And these are just examples. I took these from early on. And there's so many different verses in the Qur'an that speak directly to the Prophet in the second person. Ya ayyuhan nabiyu, O Prophet, inna arsanaka, we have sent you to the end of the verse. Laysa alayka hudahum, you are not responsible for people's guidance. And the examples go on and on, but I guarantee you, if you start tracing this, it will open up a huge door for you to understand the relationship of the best of creation with the Creator, subhanahu wa ta'ala. Because of how many times Allah speaks to the beloved Prophet Muhammad sallallahu in the second person. وَعَلَّمَكَ مَا لَمْ تُكُنْ تَعْلَمْ He taught you that which you used not used to know. وَكَانَ فَضْلُ اللَّهِ عَلَيْكَ 
What does the Prophet experience? Allah is saying, indeed, Allah's favor upon you is great. This requires a dhok. It requires to we spiritually taste this. Afallahu anka. Allah first parted him before he even mentioned what it is that he's parting him for. Lima adanta lahum. Why did you give them permission to stay behind? And they say this is, shows our Prophet, it was so beloved to Allah, even though that it was better for it to have done so. Afallahu anka. Allah pardoned you. Lima adanta lahum. Why did you give them permission? And then if we look at that multiple other that examples uh, in the uh, last juz of the Quran, we didn't include it here because most of us know these uh, know these various chapters. And that beginning with the last three chapters of the Quran, Allah Taala begins. We sometimes we call them in English the three quls, okay? And that's Qulhu Allah had Surah Al Falak and Surah Al Nas. That there's a reference to the Prophet O oh, Prophet. That's how it's translated in brackets. Allah is commanding, commanding the Prophet to tell us these realities. And so there's a narration that indicates that one time a group of companions came out to seek the Prophet to pray with them. And then that they finally found the Prophet and that he said to them, Qul, and the narrator, he says, I didn't respond. And then they, they, they said to him, the Prophet said to him, Qul, and he didn't respond. MashaAllah, this thing is drooping down on me here. MashaAllah. There we go. I think it's got to just it's gotta get that right angle and it sticks. Maybe not. There we go. And then the Prophet Sallallahu that eventually said to him that Qul a'udhu bi rabbil falak Say Qul and then he went on to recite Surat al-Falaq. And um, that this is very significant because there are multiple examples that in the last juz of the Quran. Look at Surat Fil. Alim tara kayfa fa'ara rabbuka have you not seen what your Lord has done bi ashab al fil with the ashab the companions of the elephant and they say that this indicates that Allah caused that to happen even though the prophet was not born yet this was during the time of the prophet's grandfather Abdul Muttalib Allah caused that to happen in preparation for the birth of the messenger of Allah so in other words it is as if that Allah warding off Abraha's army from the Kaaba was for Rasulullah. Because he was born 50 days after, according to the dominant opinion, the incident of the elephant. And so that's, we can extract that meaning from Allah saying, he could have said, have you not seen what Allah did with the Ashab al -Fil? But he said, Rabbuka. And that Keep reading, Surah Al-Alaq, Iqra Bismi Rabbika, read in the name of your Lord. Keep reading, Surah Al-Sharh, Alam Nashrah Laka Sadrak. This is profound. Have we not expanded for you your heart? Allah could have said, Alam Nashrah Sadrak. Have we not expanded your heart? Alam Nashrah Laka Sadrak. Wa wada'na anka. Wizrak, Alladhi Ankara Dahrak, Warafa'na Laka Dikrak. Allahu Akbar. In other words, is that this is amazing. When you start really reflecting upon this, it opens up a whole new meaning for you. It will change the way forever the way you read the Book of Allah. And you will start to see that how central it is, even in the discourse of the Quran and how it relates to the Prophet Muhammad and it will completely dispel this myth that somehow that this is not acceptable for us to have this loving and intimate relationship with the Messenger of Allah on the contrary we'll see this is the reality of the deen and the way that we're supposed to be and in fact the only way to attain the higher degrees of closeness to Allah it's all through this door 
It's all through him. It's all through understanding this. And this is why we spent time going through all of these examples. One of the other greatest examples is Surat al-Duha. Wal-Duha. Wal-Layli ila saja. Ma wadda'aka rabbuka wa ma qala. When they said that your Lord has left you, there was a pause in revelation. Your Lord has not left you, nor does he loathe you. وَلَلْآخِرَةُ خَيْرُ لَكَ مِنَ الْأُولَى Is that the hereafter is better for you, خَيْرُ لَكَ مِنَ الْأُولَى than this world. And then look at this. وَلَسَوْفَ يُعْتِيكَ رَبُّكَ فَتَرْضَى Look at how many times he speaks to him in the second person. That وَلَسَوْفَ يَعْتِيكَ And surely your Lord will give so much to you that you will be pleased. So وَلَسَوْفَ يَعْتِيكَ أَنْتَ he will give you that Rabbuka, your Lord. Allah could have said, you take Allah. But he says, Rabbuka, your Lord. Fatalda, So that you will be content. These are deep meanings. Very deep meanings. And then Allah Ta'ala explaining the blessings upon him. Alam yajidka yatiman fa'awa. Wa wajadaka dhalim wa wajadaka a'ilan. How many times is it mentioned? And then ends... وَمَّا بِنِعْمَةِ رَبِّكَ فَحَدَّثِ This is profound. How many times the second person is. So when we're reading this, is that we shouldn't just pass over this. We should think about Allah is speaking to the Prophet ﷺ. But again, to really that fixate on this meaning. When you read this, and you're aware that Allah is addressing the Prophet ﷺ, and you're realizing how amazing that is, by you annihilating yourself in the Prophet ﷺ, and that completely following him inwardly and outwardly, you are directly opening up the door for you to receive the portion of what Allah is telling the Prophet ﷺ in these verses. So in other words, you're going through difficulty, you feel a dry spot, and then you read this verse, مَا وَدْعَكَ رَبُّكَ مَا قَالَ that, that gives you hope. Your Lord did not abandon you. And if he didn't abandon the Prophet, says, if you're trying to be like him, he's not going to abandon you either. Nor is he going to loathe you. It's to remind us, no matter what it is that we experience in this world, what it's going to receive in the hereafter is better than what we're going to receive here. And that to the extent that we are Muhammadi, is that we follow him, Allah will give us what it is that we want. And the secret there is to make what we want what Allah wants. And then if we want what Allah wants, Allah will give us everything that it is that we want. And that's the secret. And then, if we start thinking about our own selves, how the Prophet was raised, but then we think about our own life, look at what Allah did to you, how He took care of you. Think about how many times in our life where you could have died, you could have been seriously injured, something horrible could have happened, but He protected us. And then how many times that for us, it actually really would have been going astray. For the Prophet ﷺ, there's different interpretations of But for us, is that we really were astray. And then Allah gave us guidance. And then He found you a need and then grant you sufficiency. So these are huge doors for us. And then, the last one that we will mention here is, is that in Surah Al-Balad, and where Allah says, لا أقسم بهذا البلد I swear by this city, the blessed city of Mecca. وأنت حلون بهذا البلد And you are inhabitant of this city, of this land. And um, this indicates that the Prophet ﷺ, we don't say that he was honored by being born in Mecca and Mukarramah. If we truly understand things, we say that Mecca and Mukarramah was honored to have the Prophet be born in it. And this is the way that we see all fadl, all bounty that Allah Ta'ala gives in creation, is that He gives by visa be the Prophet Muhammad وسلم, and that all distinction in reality with Allah true distinction that leads to the varying degrees in the hereafter is all even with the other prophets in relation to the Prophet Muhammad That's the reality.
In other words, the closer that we are to Him, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, the closer that we are to Allah and the more that we will experience from the bliss of the hereafter as a result. And in closing, this is encapsulated in some very blessed lines of poetry by the great Imam Sheikh Yusuf al Nabahani, where he speaks about his love of the Prophet and teaches us the necessary adab that we should have. And he says, Ana abdun li Sayyid al Anbiya'i, wa wala'i al Qadim wa I am a servant of the master of the messengers and my love for him is ancient ana abdun li abdihi wa li abdi abdi abdun kada bi ghintihi i am the servant of his servant and the servant of his servant's servant in this way until no end in other words is that the least affiliation to the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam in any way is what i really want أنا لا أنتهي أن القرب من باب رضاه في جملة الدخلاء. I will never cease to draw near to him through the door of his contentment among those who enter. أنشر العلم في معاليه للناس. I will continue to spread knowledge about his lofty attributes to people. وأشدو به مع شعرائي. And I will write poetry wherein which that I praise him in verse form. فَعَسَاهُ يُقُولُ لِي I hope that he will say to me أَنْتَ سَلْمَانُ وَلَائِي You are the Salman of my love حَسَّانُ حُسْنِ ثَنَائِي And the Hassan who praises me in beautiful ways. In other words, as our Prophet said to Salman Salman مِنَّ الْأَهْلِ I hope he says that to me. And some people might hear that either from the Prophet directly in their dreams or from the greatest inheritor of the Prophet alive who can do that. Or حَسَّانُ حُسْنِ ثَنَائِي just as the way that the Prophet that donned Imam al-Busayn in the dream with his blessed cloak, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. وَبِرُوحِ Look at what these way these people are. أَفْدِي تُرَابَهِ مَاهُ With my spirit, I will sacrifice it and make it ransom for the dirt of his sanctuary. The dust of his sanctuary. I, for him, I mean, kaif. For the dust of of his sanctuary, his blessed city, the places that he walked, that I would sacrifice my ruh, the most precious thing to me, my spirit, for even the dust of his sanctuary. And then look at the adab. وَلَهُ الْفَضْلُ فِي قَبُولِ فِي And it is his grace upon me for him to accept my ransom and my sacrifice. Meaning that if I sacrifice my soul for dust that he walked on, is that if he accepts my sacrifice, the blessing is mine. It's his that grace upon me and not the opposite. I haven't done him a favor. He's the one who's done me a favor by accepting my sacrifice. <laughs> that the one who has a connection to him, yentami, literally is affiliated with him, fahs, will be successful and felicitous. And he has no need of those people. He is not in need of anyone in creation except his Lord. His Lord is not in creation. He's not in need of anyone in creation. All he needs is his Lord. Everyone else in creation is in need of Rasulullah. He only needs Allah. But everyone else in creation needs him. He belongs to Allah alone. Abduh al his pure servant, Majlis Sifati Wal Asma'i. He is the Majla and the, the manifestation of his attributes and his names. Kullu Fadlan Fil Khali. This is the Shahad I was trying to get to. All good and merit in creation, Fahwa min Allahi. It is from Allah, Ilahi, to Him, Wa Minhu, and then from Him, Lil Asha'i. To all other things. So all good in creation, all merit, anything that is of worth is a blessing from Allah to him and then from him to everything else in creation. That is how we understand our Prophet said, if we have these means, it will enrich our heart and it will adorn it with the loftiest and most sublime and beautiful of meanings that are possible. May Allah Ta'ala teach us to have 
spoke and to experience the beauty of these meanings and to love them and long for them. And when the heart is attached to them, our Lord is too generous to allow us to depart from this world and to that not experience them. Ya Arhamur Rahmin, may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala bring our hearts to life with these meanings, Ya Allah. And bless us, Ya Allah, to not have our nafs get in the way from the ruh's experience of them. May Allah ta'ala embed them in all of our hearts, in the hearts of our children, in our community, and in the ummah of our Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. There are no meanings that can rise to the heart that will lead to Nasr, to this Ummah having victory like these meanings. These are the meanings of victory. And may Allah Ta'ala adorn our hearts with them, Ya Rahman Rahmin. And may Allah Ta'ala that grant us relief and grant the Ummah of our Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam relief, Ya Rahman Rahmin. And our blessed dear brothers and sisters in Palestine, especially in Gaza, Ya Rahman, we ask you to keep them strong. And the blessing of Ihtisab Alik. And to seek reward from you. And to be patient and to endure. Ya Arham Rahmin, all of those, Ya Allah, who are suffering, may Allah ease their suffering and to bless them to receive their reward directly from Him and all of those who have returned to Allah. May Allah Ta'ala raise them to the highest degrees of closest to them, Ya Arham Rahmin. And may Allah Ta'ala protect the Ummah of our Prophet Sallallahu in Gaza and in the West Bank and all throughout Palestine, Ya Arham Rahmin. And ward off the plotting of the enemies, Ya Arham Rahmin. And to return their plots into their own necks, Ya Arham Rahmin. May Allah protect them and to preserve them, Ya Allah. And to grant him faraj and relief, Ya Alham Rahmin, or Salah Allah as Eden Muhammad and Wal Ali, who serve you, Sunday, Sir Sir Fatah, we are Hadr to Nabi Sinus. Fatah. I mean, Jazakam Rahay, thank you so much. It's always wonderful to be back. Uh, home to the Bay Area and to be with so many blessed people and to be with all of you. And I reward Asif and everyone at MCC and everyone in this community. And inshallah, stay together and be together as a very blessed community with very blessed people. And inshallah, we hope that we see you all again soon. Bi'atina barakallahu